I think in the next three to four months through the rest of this year, it's going to be a really volatile time. You have to be opportunistic. You have to be patient. And you have to realize that this probably is going to go on for a bit. The Fed is going to face an increasingly more difficult challenge this time around. When they pause, you want to be very wary about the relief rally. You are fighting the Fed if you're bullish. It's hard to find anybody that's bullish now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a difficult couple of days. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambert, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down a tenth of 1%. TK, the last three days, down 5% on the S&P. It's really fragile, and some of it is just the distribution of that down 5%, the different sectors, John. The one shining light for not the bulls, but I guess the less bears, is the VIX really hasn't moved. John, the sweat that's out there, the August sweat that's out there says VIX 30. VIX is at 26. We're playing off the data, Tom. Good news is bad news, apparently. Consumer confidence yesterday, uh, job openings. They're moving in the right direction. Good news, bad news. The Fed's got to do a whole lot more. This market struggled. We're going to wait for the data. We start to see that today with ADP. I don't know what to make of ADP, John. I, I just don't. I'll be honest. I just don't trust it. But there's a lot of the data I do trust on. And it's in America, it's just where are we into September? I believe that's tomorrow. Well, Lisa, let's start with the data out of Europe. Bad news is bad news. Yeah, 9.1% consumer price inflation in the euro region coming in above expectations for 9%, really fueling these fears and these expectations of a 75 basis point rate hike, not by the Fed, by the ECB. And this is what we have to keep talking about. All of a sudden, we've reset expectations, not just for Fed rate hikes getting more, bigger than expected, but also over in Europe. And what does that magnitude, that sort of joint effort, really mean for markets? Have you seen how much the German two year has moved through the month? First thing I looked at today. Up 92 First thing. basis points, Tom. Lisa, that is unbelievable. Up to 1.2% from down in the 20s, 26, <laughs> 27 basis points to start the month. And it's not just there. And it's not just nominal yields. If you look at real yields, both in Europe and in the United States, they've risen to the highest levels since the heart of the pandemic, since the disruptions that really called the Fed into action. How much are we seeing a resetting that's been fully priced into the rest of the uh, risk assets versus maybe not so much? And this is why the equity market's struggling still this morning. Good morning to you. If you're just tuning in, we're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. No drama on the Nasdaq, at least for now, up about a tenth of 1%. Call it two tenths of 1% higher. Yields higher again, though, up five or six basis points on a 10-year to 315.88 euro dollar negative four tenths of one percent 99.76 bramo it's all about your world the bond yeah. market yeah and this is how it really goes to the question that you were asking yesterday and you've been asking all year which is if the euro region if the ecb does raise rates by 75 basis points is that positive or negative for the euro right now it is negative and it is also because of the backdrop with the energy crisis today the Nord Stream one is shutting for a three-day maintenance maybe maybe it'll come back online gazprom is halting exports of natural gas to Europe during this period of time. Will it come back online is the big question. In the meantime, you are seeing natural gas prices climb a little bit from the declines yesterday and the day before in Europe. The reason why they had declined is because there, were, uh, there was evidence that stockpiles were building faster than people had expected. But still, in my mind, this is the story heading into the fall. This could really shape what happens in Europe and, frankly, globally with respect to sentiment. 8.15 a.m., Tom, you were talking about the ADP employment change. They have rejiggered some of those mm. expectations. You don't know what to make of them. I think it actually takes on more import, not necessarily because of how they've rejiggered expectations, but because of the jolts data yesterday, which was rather shocking. It was expected to go down. It did not. It went up. There were more openings that were posted, two openings for every unemployed American. This is not what... Uh, the Fed would like to see. They want to see tightening. They are not seeing it. Today, perhaps we'll get some indication of how uh, Fed speakers well, are really uh, speaking to that, Tom. I think it's interesting. That was a weak morning for research, but the key note was the Alan Ruskin note on the beverage curve. And he says the U.S. is different, and it folds right into the JOLT survey where you've got the idea that vacancies in America make us different, and maybe we won't see a higher unemployment rate. Well, this is the dream for the soft landing, and we might get some more sense of how close or far away we are from Loretta Mester, who's speaking at 8 a.m. Uh, then we're going to be hearing from Lori Logan. Yeah, I am I'm not lost. as familiar with her. She is the new Dallas Fed president, and she'll be speaking at 6 p.m. And at 6.30 p.m., we'll hear from Raphael. Bach. John, I'm lost. Didn't they just speak? Who, Tom? Mester and Bostic? 
the three of them. I mean, maybe Laurie Logan didn't, but... I think we met Laurie Logan, Tom. Didn't, but didn't on Friday they just speak like Thursday. three cups of coffee ago? I think we've heard from them a few times I think we've already. Heard from a few the message, times. though, pretty clear, Tom, and I think that's the theme here for a lot of people. They have stayed on the same page, the same script, repeatedly. Yeah. Repeatedly, gotta, every single one of them over the last few days. John, John Williams as well of the New York Fed. To your point about the markets, look, the two-year has just broken out to a new high, and with it, the yen is right up against new yen weakness. There's a tension out there. It screams August. Very, very close to 350 at 349.29. Right now, Christian Nolding joins us, Global Chief Investment Officer at Deutsche Bank Private Bank. Christian, we have taken out the June highs on a two-year yield, and the question a lot of people are asking is whether this equity market has to test the June lows. Your thoughts? Well, from, from our point of view, if you think from a growth perspective, we do think there is a, at least mild recession coming in the U.S., and there's also recession unavoidable for us in the Eurozone. And from that perspective, I wouldn't be surprised if equity markets go down a bit further from here. And we have been calling, um, saying the June, June dry uptick is, is probably not, is a bear market rally, is probably not where we end. We have been arguing for buy the next dip. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see, and if you look at the, the markets, it's another three, four, five, six percent, depending on the market's downside. I wouldn't rule out that we get there. From, from our point of view. Christian, what do you do with bonds? The chart that I put up earlier of price flat yield, I guess up a little bit, global bonds on an aggregate basis are back 11 years. What do you do with that institutionally? Well, from our point of view, it has been right to be short duration and we kept it. So from that perspective, at least uh, you, you can avoid to be super long duration as, as many investors sometimes have to be. I think that's number one. And then you really need to look at quality from our point of view. So um, you had discussed before if there's a recession, what does it mean to credit spreads? I think we also need to look a little bit ahead as we don't expect, at least in the US, a sustained long recession. Maybe it's two quarters, three quarters. I think if spreads are widening, there is an opportunity. If you look into investment grade, I would be a bit more careful on the, on the high yield side from our point of view. We don't think these levels, which seem attractive, uh, but uh, from our point of view, is not where we want to go in right now. Christian, is, is Europe in a toxic place to invest in right now based on the energy backdrop and some of the volatility there? Or are you still seeing perhaps some opportunities even ahead of the U.S.? Well, I wouldn't call it toxic place, to be very honest. But of course, uh, it, it's tough to be very <clears throat> optimistic about Europe at this point in time. Let's call it like this. I think there are opportunities. If you think the ECB is, is doing quite a lot, as we do, we can imagine over the next 12 months, the ECB is moving from zero now to two, which is quite something, I would say. There is, I think, opportunities in European financials which could profit from that. But for the overall market, it depends really on the energy crisis and how the winter plays out to be. Uh, and from that perspective, uh, it, it's not going to be easy for Europe the next months, I think. Christian, did you just say that you're investing in European banks? Yeah, I think European financials have upside because, uh, as I said, if the ECB is moving, they can profit from, from a higher interest rate level. Uh, and from that perspective, now we're at zero. And I would expect the ECB not to look so much at growth because their target is really price stability and to move up uh, in increasing rates. And from that perspective, I think that would be positive for them, yes. Hey, Christian, they're hiking into a recession. What's more important here, the rate hikes or the economic true. backdrop? Yeah, but I think, yeah, recession, yes. But also here in Europe, I think it's not a recession, which is a deep recession, which, which takes quarters and quarters. Uh, from that perspective, yes, there is some implication. And you have not seen a massive movement upwards, although the market is pricing some of the ECB hikes, not all. I think we, the ECB is doing more. And from that perspective, I think there could be some positives uh, being overgrowth, looking at rate hikes from our point of view. Well, that's Indeed. a trade for the brave. Christian, thank you, sir. Christian Nolan there of Deutsche Bank Private Bank. Lisa Brambitz getting long European banks. I actually heard that from Sandlin to Brown over at BNP Paribas a number of months ago, but that was at the June lows. It wasn't in the mess we're in right now. Look, this has been the pain trade. Uh, there is an upside argument, especially if suddenly people have been complaining about negative rates for the past decade, and you don't have negative rates anymore, and that could be a benefit. But to your point, hiking into weakness, is it the weakness that matters or the hiking that matters? And the currency market is saying it's the weakness that matters because that is what the euro is responding to. And I really have to take some keys from that. And this is what the European banks have wanted, Tom, for a long, long time. They're getting it, though, 
in a very, very oh, I, difficult I, I, moment. John, you're being way too kind. Their performance has been absolutely irresponsible. It's at the board of directors level. I just looked at the chart for my good friends at BMP Paribas. Glad they support tennis. They've gone nowhere in 13 years. 75 basis point hike is the expectation, Tom, yeah. at the ECB now. Capital economics out this morning, 9.1% CPI. And to Lisa's point, if you're looking at these banks right now, let's put it all together. TK's questioning the execution. Lisa, you're questioning the economic backdrop. Is rates, is rates enough to be supportive of stock prices for European banks? Well, just take a look at what we've been hearing from all of the banks. Take a look at the capital markets activity. You're not getting the revenues from that because you've seen a massive slowdown, perhaps a little bit of a pickup in the rally. But otherwise, IPOs, whether it's uh, debt issuances, whether it's you know stock offerings, whatever it is, it is all stopped. So then yeah. what is going to be the marginal driver? Okay, trading. Well, uh, there it's kind of uh, a little bit uh, sketchy compared to where it has been traditionally <laughs> because of how unpredictable it is. Here's the marginal driver, John. Was it three cups of coffee ago that Bank A was moving 250 people into Asia? Oh, yeah. And now they're moving them out. And John, the so guy the same that, thing. John, the guy that lives next door to you in that walk-up you live in was a spec banker. He's toast. Lisa has picked up on the right theme. You mentioned Asia. You mentioned some of the banks pulling back on deals. Fold yeah. it into one story. Bramo, this is what the banks have got to do. Pull back. Is it any surprise that Goldman and Morgan Stanley are now saying, let's go, let's go? COVID rules are gone. Get back to work in September. You know, I, and especially, it's not a coincidence that it's in tandem with the school starting, right? Basically, it's like, okay, you guys don't have an excuse anymore. Let's go. Last September, it was let's go, and then it was like, oh. Maybe not. No, no, we this can't, is, maybe not. This September feels... It's real. Can I say it's real? <laughs> yeah. Can I say it's real, Tom? <laughs> is it real this time? I Get to work. See you in September. Okay, that's nice. Who sung that? Thank you. Tom right. Keen did. It's August. <laughs> that's that new song. That was, yeah. Let's put right. a banner up on radio. Okay. Put the banner up. It's special. August. Sure. Futures unchanged from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Inflation in the Eurozone has set another all-time high. Consumer prices in the 19-country currency block rose 9.1% in August from a year ago. That beat the median estimate in a Bloomberg survey of economists, and it strengthens the case for the European Central Bank to consider a jumbo interest rate hike when it meets next week. The Justice Department says White House records held in a storage room at Donald Trump's Florida home may have been moved before an FBI search in June. The Justice Department says that could have been an attempt to obstruct the investigation. In a filing, there was a photo of files labeled top secret, said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. It's the biggest two-year decline in U.S. life expectancy in almost a century, and it's blamed on the COVID pandemic. Life expectancy fell by almost a year in 2021 after a decline of 1.8 years in 2020. The pandemic has been directly responsible for more than 1 million American deaths. And shares of Snap are falling today, according to The Verge. The parent of Snapchat plans to lay off about 20% of its nearly 6,500 employees starting today. The stock already has fallen almost 80% this year. Snap has been struggling with a slowdown in advertiser spending. And Mikhail Gorbachev is being remembered as the last leader of the Soviet Union who, who ended the Cold War. Gorbachev died Tuesday at a Moscow hospital. His attempts to shake up the Soviet Union's political and economic system led to the collapse of the communist superpower. Gorbachev's career disintegrated in the process. He was 91. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Richard. We're committed to getting uh, inflation under control, and there's a path to get there. A recession is obviously a risk uh, in the process. Um, I'll just say, for context, nobody ever canceled the business cycle. So the, the, you, when you say there's a risk of recession, it doesn't have to be like a 2008 uh, recession. Thomas Mark in there, the Richmond Fed president, live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures just about positive on the S&P after three days of losses on the S&P 500. Big losses as well, with positive just two points, up by not even a tenth of one percent. It's pretty clear to me, to everyone, that Fed officials are saying we're happy with the market reaction. We're going to tighten. We're going to stay there. We're not going to back away. The first sign of success. The hurdle to pause, Lisa, is higher. The hurdle to cut is higher. Do you want to fight that? 
No, and that's, that was your question yesterday, and the answer that we heard from Sebastian Page was no. If you want to fight that and think that we're going to see gains, good luck, but you're probably going to get your face ripped off in uh, Wall Street parlance. The question that I have is what have we priced in? And some people are saying small caps, for example, have fully priced in recession. What about big tech? What about some of the drivers? What has priced in recession and what hasn't? And how much are people going to really discern between the two? Short and shallow seems to be the theme. Tom, and not just on the United States, even oh, in Europe. I, just heard from Deutsche Bank there, talking about a yeah, European recession, and I, we still hear this short and uh, shallow kind of story. Uh, John, I have a huge problem with this because I've been wrong so many times, you can line them right up. Let's start with 1980 and 81 and the double recession wrapped around Paul Volcker. It's hard to pick the recession, let alone define it. John, it's even harder to get the magnitude right. I couldn't agree more, Tom. And I'm not here to say it won't be a short and shallow one. It's not for me to say that. I, I will say I think I'm we should be open-minded, given how wrong right. we've been about so many different things I, over just two years. John, we got to go back to it. we got a 348 in the two-year. Quickly here, John, yen is just this far away from yen weakness. It's a global issue right now. And we've taken out the highs of the middle yeah. of June, June 14th, on a two-year <clears> yield. We've taken them out. 348.27 right now came really close to 350. And back when we were at those kind of levels yeah. in the middle of June, this equity market was a whole lot lower. Folks, John Farrell has figured out that tuition in the United States is a breeze. This is the week where the tuition checks get written and the agony is out there. There's also agony in the political space. Jack Fitzpatrick joins us the end of August to reshape to September and the election. Jack Pugh does the best research on this. It is stunning when they looked recently at the political typology of America, how small the middle is. They've got two surveys, Republicans and Democrats, somewhere between 23 and 28 percent of America is the middle. Are they worth going after for these politicians? Uh, in recent years, I think you can find some evidence that there, there's less focus on going after anybody who would describe themselves as persuadable. Uh, a, a lot of this is about motivation of the base. You see it in primaries. Uh, at, at the same time, you know, especially just looking at President Biden's speech last night, I, I think there is a bit of a, a persuasion attempt there when you hear him talking about funding for the police uh, and funding and, and support for the FBI uh, and kind of going on a, a two-track right. uh, example. They, you know, they, there, are, there are some seemingly winning political messages that still go for it. Right. persuasion rather than motivation. But overall, big picture, uh, mm. the last decade or so has been a, a, a way more of a shift toward right. getting your base out, focusing on turnout, and that's a, a, nati a national right. trend. Jack, sort of a personal question. I have the clearest memory of sitting on the couch, I believe it was a Sunday evening, when Lyndon Baines Johnson stunned the nation and said he would not run for a second term. Are we going to hear that tomorrow night? Uh, that's still a big question in Washington. I, I don't know about tomorrow night. Um, the, there, if that were the case, there's still the question about the strength of somebody like Kamala Harris and, and who would be the front runner for the Democratic position. Uh, I, I haven't heard from anybody who feels confident that tomorrow is the night, but you have heard uh, some, some, uh, some hints from Democrats who don't think that the president is going to run again. It came up in the New York race where Carolyn Maloney brought it up a couple times. Uh, it's something they're not supposed to say but there is a, a bit of an expectation out there that the president wouldn't run again. Uh, I don't know if that's imminent or, or not at this point. Just quickly, Jack, are we hearing anything about the student loan relief and whether that's actually going to get legally challenged, whether that's actually going to go into effect? Uh, there could be legal challenges, but a lot of the pushback at this point has been uh, Republicans talking about how the president should not have this power and what can be done in the future to take that away. Uh, it's a little hard to predict exactly how this would play out in courts if there is a legal challenge now. But uh, again, a lot of the focus has been uh, the political pushback and maybe some future legislative pushback, depending on how much Republicans take back in, in the midterms. Jack, can I ask the question we ask every now and again? Where's Janet Yellen? <laughs> uh, I, uh, still still a, a little more low profile than you might expect for someone like her. Uh, same, same story. Uh, a lot of focus on the Fed, some talk from the president on the economy. Uh, I, I wish I could come in here with an answer on the whole story about Biden and Yellen and, and the whole relationship. 
Utterly but, uh, bizarre. a little bit quiet. Jack, thank you. Dan in Washington. Jack Fitzpatrick. TK, it is utterly bizarre. How do you manage to recruit one of the best labour market economists on the planet, the former Fed chair yes. to Treasury Secretary, and then tumbleweed, uh, like kind of nothing? I, I will never forget this. I was standing in the early morning looking across the White House lawn. This is Bush the Younger. And I realized that everything was run out of the White House. And there's been a modern disease. I don't know if it's the same in London. But there's a modern disease here that everything gets run out of the White House and the cabinet members are figureheads. Frankly, Mr. Blinken has been maybe a little less visible than Kissinger was, to say the least. John, we've got a major issue on Twitter. Tots are tweeting out that it's a derby. Is it a derby or a derby today with West Ham? Technically, technically, that makes it a London derby. Though it's typically, derby. we talk about a North London hey. derby and, between and Tottenham and Arsenal, and West Ham is an East London team, Tom, can, and can, Tottenham is a North London well, I've got to break team. up the surveillance nap for this this afternoon, John, but West Ham, they've basically sucked since Nate Shelley joined the team, right? I think you're well aware that he's not actually a manager, <laughs> well, right? Well, he's a coach. He's up from Championship League, I think. No, I think, I think Mr. Moyes will have a problem with that, Tom. You really do think that Ted Lasso is real life, don't you? It is. Yeah, he Special. came from Wichita. I think when, Wichita When's State. the new season come? I have no idea. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a documentary, so they got to maybe have the history. It's a proper documentary. They need to get the season wrapped up, and then we'll see how Nate did at West Ham. You're ridiculous. Thank Futures, you. Positive two tenths of 1% on the S&P. You and should the go and do 100, some research on this. Up six tenths of 1%. You're doing research right now. No, in London. You want to do a road trip to London? Absolutely. To see how Nate's September getting on says at West road Ham. trip, London. <laughs> <laughs> Ramo's like, count me out. Count me out. <laughs> From New York City this morning, good morning. Heard on radio, seen on TV. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. It's the price action, the shape of things so far. Early days, up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Call it two tenths if you want. On the Nasdaq 100, up five or six tenths of 1%. Following the biggest three-day route on the S&P 500 since June 14th, down 5% over the last three days. What happened back on June 14th? Yields topped out for the year, and then we took out the closing high of June 14th just yesterday in this bond market. Two tens and thirties look like that. We took out the June 14th high on the two-year, not the 10-year. Right now, 348.27. New multi-year highs here. Yield higher again by four basis points. That's biting, eating into the equity market over the last couple of days. As this Fed, this Fed communicates pretty strongly. It's ready to go again. <clears throat> go big if we have to, off the back of better than expected data yesterday, and then stay there. The New York Fed president to the Wall Street Journal yesterday found this very, very fascinating that everyone's on the same page at the moment about <clears throat> staying there and staying there, Tom, for a prolonged period of time. I, the Fed speak, I'm, I, I'm baffled by. The Fed speak, frankly, John, we heard in Jackson Hole and we get a new round of it today. Are we just going to hear the same thing? I think so. Possibly. They're all saying on the same script, Tom. If you think yeah. the Fed is fascinating, confusing, pick ever, whatever word you want. The ECB. <laughs> I tell you what, the Hawks are in charge of the ECB right yes. now, that's for sure. The Bundesbank yesterday were talking about going big again, even if you do fear a recession. Don't fear that. Let's go again. This morning, off the back of CPI coming in with a nine handle, the Bundesbank communicating again, we need to act decisively. So picture this. You've gone on a German two-year at the start of August from about 27 basis points at a close on a first trading day of this month to 1.2%. So that's a move of more than 90 basis points right. over the last month. And yet the euro is weaker on the month, not stronger. John, euro dollar Tom, 99, 81. You live this. Is Germany and France on the same page in terms of a let's go hawkish front loaded tone? At the moment, they are, Tom. And the difference between potentially this ECB and what we saw in the previous 10 years under Draghi specifically yeah. is that this time the hawks are in charge in a big, big way, Tom. Yeah, they seem to be. There's no question about that. Let's jump to this right now. I'm watching Yen again, which hasn't moved here, but still really front and center. Mohamed El Arian just out moments ago with a two-year chart that was very smart, showing the emotion of the moment. If your head is spinning here the end of August and you're worried about inflation gloom like Italy with 9% inflation, this is flat out the interview of the day and recapitulates what we heard from David Rosenberg yesterday. Luke Tilley's in a different uh, place. He's head of asset allocation, chief economist 
at Wilmington Trust, and we're thrilled he could join us today. Luke, I thought your note was uncommonly cogent about the disinflation to come. Put a date on it. When does the disinflation show up? Uh, last month. <laughs> we had uh, a really encouraging reading in CPI and then also in PCE, clearly pulled down by energy. But what we're seeing is that weakening of inflation, much slower advances and outright declines in a lot of consumer goods, airfares, used cars, and a lot of those things that have pushed inflation up <clears throat> over the past year to year and a half. Uh, but it is kind of bimodal. We still have a lot of pressure on shelter and rents and on food. Uh, those, right. those are running much higher than usual, uh, but we do see a lot of disinflation for those other categories. I like the idea of a bimodal. The theory here is any central bank, including the Fred, given a bimodal distribution, will always take the part of the bimodal that shows up later. They'll be massively ex post. Is this a Fed that reacts to a bimodal disinflation at the September meeting or at the September meeting of 2023? Well, I think at the September meeting, they were likely to see a 50 basis point hike, and that's because we're going to get another inflation number, and I do expect it to be a little bit on the weaker side, not quite as weak as July, uh, but what they're setting themselves up for is 50 basis points. And I think Jay Powell was talking a lot more about the profile when he was in Jackson Hole. That speech was clearly hawkish, but he wasn't really talking about the magnitude of hikes going forward. It seemed like, as you were just saying, they're all on the same page. And all of those FOMC voters are pushing back on the futures curve, which is showing rate cuts next year. So I think in September we get that 50 basis point cut. Another really important thing is what he said in July, not at Jackson Hole, is that the rate cut, the rate hikes that they've already done, uh, we haven't felt the full impact of them yet. There's a lot of tightening in the pipeline, he said, and we're going to see those come through and slow inflation down over the course of this year. So, Luke, when you say that you're already starting to see disinflation, and even with the hawkish tilt of the Federal Reserve, are you basically positioning around that and being more bullish on risk assets because the Fed won't go as far as the market is currently pricing? Or are you basically suggesting the Fed is going to, because they are so exposed, make a policy error and tighten into recession even if it's not necessary? Well, we've never gotten so pessimistic that we went underweight. We're neutral across our asset allocation in the equity categories, and we have an overweight to cash. We're looking to deploy that uh, because even though our baseline is for inflation to slow down, there's clearly a lot of upside risks. And the one that we're really watching, of course, is wages and labor. And Pal and the other FOMC members have talked about that. If those wages keep pushing higher, then they are more likely to keep tightening. And even if, they, if inflation was slowing, uh, I think you get closer to a policy error and them causing a recession. Well, just to make sure that I understand what you're saying, Luke, in other words, you're neutral on equities, you're neutral on risk, which is unusual for you because you are always invested, right? And you've been overweight cash, but now you're looking to deploy that cash. Does that mean you're getting more bullish or does that mean that you have more conviction of the path of things going forward? We're not expecting a recession and we are getting a little bit more bullish, but that big risk out there is definitely labor and we're likely to see data later this week, but looking for an opportunity to deploy that cash, uh, a bias towards risk and a bias towards equities. And I would think that that would come in the U.S., especially as valuations have come down. Uh, but it remains to be seen how much labor, labor market pressure remains. So where are you seeing opportunity most clearly? In other words, are you looking at big tech? Are you looking at, for example, energy companies, even as we see uh, one of the uh, consecutive monthly declines in oil prices on the, on the fear of a slowdown globally? Well, if our baseline plays out, uh, then we would expect to see, uh, as Jonathan was just talking about, we haven't really seen long-term rates move uh, back up very much. It's on the short end. We would expect the short end to come down a little bit, and that would point towards some growth stocks that would point towards a recovering economy and the sectors that really uh, benefit from that, from long rates holding where right. they are uh, and a little bit more growth. Look, I tried it out yesterday, one of the great series on the Bloomberg, which is simply CPI, not back to 1947, but our guesstimates back to World War I. And inflation, when it surges up, is wildly stochastic and comes down quickly. Given the pandemic and the supply side realities, the dynamics, I should say, are we going to see another bout of stochastic surge in inflation reverse to disinflation? I think there's a good chance that things come down pretty quickly. And this gets back to uh, transitory, which I realize is a dirty word now. Uh, but we are looking at a lot of inflation that's been caused by that supply chain 
uh, challenge from last year and also a lot of stimulus, which of course is rolling off now. Yeah. Uh, so when you see Walmart cutting prices, when you see retailers saying, oops, you know, we, we ordered too much stuff, that's where <clears throat> you could have it come down pretty quickly. Again, the risks are definitely labor. Well, and it would also put energy in there. I'm just asking for a friend, but if you get out front of this and the markets get out in advance, should I load the boat, let's say September 1st? Well, I don't think that there's uh, any reason to expect a recession other than the Fed keep hiking. So if the baseline inflation story plays out and if you get some weaker wages, then I think we're in pretty good shape to have an expansion going from here. Right. And that would argue for risk assets. What do your managers at Wilmington Trust think about cash? Is cash an asset considering how conservative the shop is? It's certainly more of an asset now than it was a few months ago, of course, but we're looking for uh, stronger returns if that inflation story plays out than we do think uh, equities uh, are better. You guys were talking about credit spreads. There might be some spots in a fixed income that are advantageous too, especially with high yield yielding uh, what it is. Uh, but right now, as from an asset allocation point of view, we're looking more on the equity side. Like when does the office start to fill up? What time? <laughs> Just thinking because Morgan Stanley, you know, sent out the memo. They sent out the memo at <laughs> Goldman, get back to work. When do they get in the office, Luke? Well, there's uh, uh, for us, we've been actually been back for several months. We've been back for three days a week uh, oh, for a gosh. long time now, just not quite this early. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's there's a few people around me. You can't see them right now, but uh, they'll be in pretty soon. Luke Tilly, thank you. John, we appreciate it. Of Wilmington Trust, TK, go on. I wandered out to a tennis match last night. How did that work out? I was sitting in the seats. I could watch Mets Dodgers next door. I was sitting up so high. And John... There was no other topic in the chat I did with fans. Thank you so much for coming up, folks, than work from home. Tom, that was the topic. Can I just say that I turned on ESPN and the idea that you were sitting in the seats above. I saw you right there, courtside, <laughs> sat behind Emma Raducanu. Well, it so, was I mean, good there's seats. There's no escape in this. There were you great know, seats. Where young, did you find them? The young lady from France was, uh, oh, the seats you mean? Sure. I don't know. Some of my people found them. I, you know, nice. I, don't, I don't know that stuff. Lisa and I couldn't get our people to find any. They said, I got one seat. Do you want to go? And I said, I got to take vet bill. And they said, no, you can't. The dog's got to sit in your lap. And well, I I'm said, getting poorer, Tom. You know why? Cable. One sixteen twenty seven. Oh! I cannot afford to go yes. to the US Open. This move. This move. <clears throat> Bramo, look at this. One sixteen twenty six. I think the low of the session was about one sixteen. <laughs> 18. You could go all the way back to 2020 and that big dislocation in the FX market. I'm sure you will remember that when we hit 114 or something like that yeah. in spring of 2020. Lisa, this is not a pretty picture for the UK. Are you saying that it is because of the pound weakening that you did not go to the US Open? Is that what you're basically Got saying? Some sterling savings okay. <laughs> and I'm looking at them now and I'm thinking maybe, well, maybe not. I will say just some of the projections coming about the inflationary backdrop in the United Kingdom is beyond shocking. It is beyond what we're seeing over in uh, the mainland of Europe. And you do the wonder mainland. how they're going to deal with it. What do you call it? Continental Europe? OK. But I, I'm, this is, to me, uh, one of the biggest stories, because how they deal with it is sort of a leadership yeah. role in terms of countering high gas prices with lower demand and inevitable recession. Yeah, this is going to make things much, much harder for the Bank of England and okay. I think for the ECB as well. We're seeing bigger and bigger expectations, Tom, of rate hikes from those two respective central banks. And the currencies aren't stronger. The weaker. Yeah, well, you know, that's true, John. But, you know, I, Lisa seems stressed today, John, don't you think? In what way, Tom? I, I think it's the, it's the voice of a parent wondering if the children have the right calculator to go back to school. Lisa, are the kids properly calculated? I don't know. They're asleep. And honestly, I'm going on vacation, so I'm not stressed out. They just, need the right need to get to calculator. 8.56.30. <laughs> For two more like days, that. and then or I'm eight, not off 55. ever again. So this is the last hurrah. Are you coming back afterwards? I, I <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> guarantee we'll see you John, in And I'm never going to be there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there we go. What? Oh, she's taking more vacation this summer than you and I combined. It's fantastic. No, no regrets. Future's up two-tenths of one percent. From a beautiful New York. It's beautiful. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. More revelations in the probe of those classified documents found at Donald Trump's Florida home in a court filing the Justice Department suggests there may have been attempts to obstruct the investigation by moving some of the papers. The filing included a photo of files labeled top secret, said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. 
Europe faces the risk of blackout, rationing and a severe recession if Russia slashes gas deliveries further. And the next reality check is at hand. Starting today, there'll be a halt in gas sent through the Nord Stream pipeline. It's a key source of energy for the EU. There's a concern that Moscow will find another excuse to clamp down on those supplies. And prices in British shops rose this month at the highest rate since at least 2005. According to the British Retail Consortium, shop price inflation increased to 5.1% in August. The price of food rose even more, 9.3%. Shoppers are doing everything they can to save money at the checkout, including buying less food. Two of Wall Street's best-known investment banks say it's time to come back to the office. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are removing some of their last COVID restrictions. In New York, for instance, Goldman employees with an approved exemption to the city's vaccine mandate can enter offices with no testing or face coverings. The firm has been aggressive in pushing a return to offices. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I'm paying attention to what the Fed is telling us. Uh, I think they're wrong. Uh, I think that Powell's already told us we are operating policy uh, without focusing on what's happening on the supply side of the economy. David Rosenberg there, the founder and president at Rosenberg Research, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive, just about up two tenths on the S&P after three days of losses in the equity market, amounting to about a loss of 5%, down 5% in three days. Remarkable stuff. Yields up three basis points on a 10-year, 313.81 on a two-year. We take out the highs of the year in the last 24 hours. Euro's weaker, sterling is too. Can we take a snapshot of Sterling? Yeah, John, 116.19. Oh. John, what's the emotion of 115? Is that like Dow 10,000? I don't know if it's Dow 10,000, but it's certainly troublesome for this Bank of England as they're hiking interest rates and can't gain yeah. any traction whatsoever in the FX market. What does and that mean to the people of the United Kingdom? They're not alone. Well, if you're importing inflation now, Tom, you import a whole lot more yeah. with a weaker pound Sterling. Unbelievable. What we're going to do right now, and this is a great honor to have Julie Norman with us. She's the co-director of the UCL Center on U.S. Politics, but is really definitive on continental Europe and, of course, terrorism and the study of the Middle East as well. Julie, we digress today to Mr. Gorbachev. Why does Mr. Putin hate him so much? Is it just as simple as he's the guy that gave up the Soviet Union? Well, that's certainly a lot of it, Tom. And what we see playing out, obviously, with Russia and Ukraine today, you can just draw a direct through line back to Gorbachev and the dissolution of the USSR uh, back in the day at the time when Putin was just kind of coming into his own in the KGB and just saw that dissolution right. as a complete tragedy. Um, and I would say, too, it wasn't just the dissolution, but also the uh, changes that Gorbachev made before that, the uh, the opening up of the media, the opening up of multi-party elections, right. the release of dissidents, all things that Putin, we know, has brought back. I don't want to do a history lesson here, but the idea of Gorbachev and then Yeltsin, who's one of the things I've most been wrong on in my career, we come to Putin. Who's after Putin? If you look at transfer of power of Gorbachev to Yeltsin and the rest of the dance of the Russians, how can you choose who's after Putin? Do you have any idea? I think it's a tough question, Tom, and partly just because Putin, as we know, has consolidated power so much around him and through the inner circle of the party that it's not like looking at, you know, another country that we would say who's uh, who's competitive in elections or who's popular or something like that. It's it's a very close circle, and it's one that we know Putin is going to hold on to as long as possible himself. So even the timeline on that is anyone's guess. But, Julie, Gorbachev's death really raises a question about whether Russia could be a democracy, whether democracy has failed as a project in Russia. Is Putin's legacy that whoever follows him will also be an autocratic leader because of the legacy of a democracy that did not take off in the way that many people hoped? Well, it's a good question. And, you know, Gorbachev himself, you know, obviously from the West is hailed very much as a hero. But in Russia at the time of his, uh, you know, at the time of his end of his office up till now, was very unpopular because even in that early 90s period, he could not deliver on his promises internally to what people were hoping for. And that was the economic side as well as the more political side. So I think Gorbachev was hoping that those growing pains would be temporary. Obviously, things have gone another direction. 
I think in the long durée of history, we know that doesn't mean a country is doomed to a certain trajectory forever, but it does probably indicate that it's going to be on that route for at least the coming years with someone like Putin and, again, the kinds of people he has put around him uh, in charge. Julie, heading into the fall, the focus very much will be on Europe and the natural gas situation, whether Russia is going to stop some of the exports to that region. Nordstrom 1 goes into maintenance uh, for three days. Will it come out is the big question. What is the advantage for Russia to just cut off supplies? I mean, isn't it cannibalizing from all of its future revenues? Well, it certainly seems that way, but it's also the main area where Russia, from the beginning of this crisis, has had real leverage and putting the squeeze on Europe, putting the squeeze on the UK, really just showing where they have this political, where they have this economic as well as political muscle. And so we see them leveraging that. And, you know, I think a lot of this is also tied up with uh, peripheral issues as well. So relations with China, relations with Iran, uh, these are things that are kind of helping right. some of their allies, bringing some of them closer at the same time. Julie, take us from the really, I think, pretty poor coverage in America of Ukraine, away from the generalization that the Russian military effort is stodgy, slow motion, very doctrinaire, and the Ukrainians are making it up as they go, et cetera, et cetera. That's a stereotype. What's the nuance at Kherson or the nuance in the South, et cetera, the nuance on the Baltic Sea between those two forces? Yeah, well, Tom, I think it's a good question because there's a lot that we don't know and a lot of the coverage that we are seeing is, of course, telling the story that I think a lot of viewers in the West want to hear. And in reality, the war, as we know, is already quite long. We know that Putin is trying to, uh, you know, recruit more people into the army, so sees this as something that's going to be ongoing. Uh, in Kherson, for example, it's unclear exactly how much Ukrainians have been able to push back or not. There's a lot of controversy right now around the nuclear site, so the UN is going to be uh, be moving in there today to try and stabilize that. So there's a lot of areas, especially uh, in the kind of the eastern part of the country where Russia has control that Ukraine is trying to chip away at, that is just going to be an ongoing slow slog moving into the fall and the winter. And it's uh, it's attractive to want to see these victories, and of course, some of them are there. But uh, but I think this is going to be a very long conflict, as many as many others have said as well. Julie, thank you. As always, Julie Norman there of UCL Center on U.S. Politics. Lisa, the consequences of this war will be felt for a long, long time, and these sanctions off the back of it. Look at what's happening in the U.K. right now. You do have to ask the question: How long will the resolve of this coalition last as the economic pain starts to materialize even more? Liz Truss, who is the leading candidate to be the next prime minister in the UK is talking about plans to cut taxes and raise spending. Charlie Bean, the former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, was on with our team in London earlier this morning and talked about the risk of a large sustained deficit in the medium term and how investors may start to think the UK doesn't look like such a good place to invest. What's been happening in the UK? Yields are much, much higher. Sterling is much, much weaker. What's the central bank's role in all of that? It's a big question mark, right? This is unprecedented and it's a very difficult place for them to be in. The question that you ask, though, about where is the resolve, how much is there and how much pushback do you start to get as the economic pain deepens, that goes to the Jennifer Granholm point, the energy, energy secretary in the United States, raising issues with the exports <clears throat> of natural gas from the United States to Europe because it raises the prices domestically in the United States. At what point does some of the alliances splinter in the face of economic pain that is very real and very difficult to combat from the central bank level. It was the first question Tom asked yesterday when we went through that story. Tom, is the Department of Energy on the same page as the State Department and this White House? No, in America, that's the way it is. But I think, John, to your point about currencies, and I think a lot of our listeners and viewers, John, say, well, why do we follow Sterling? Who cares? It's the litmus paper of the system. John, I didn't know this. I just did the math here, which you can do quickly on the Bloomberg. You're Sterling, John, February 24th, Putin. 14% depreciation. Brutal. That's stunning. That's one, stunning. one heck of a move, Tom. That's for sure. Futures are up about a third of 1%. The Nasdaq bouncing back by eight or nine tenths of 1%. We'll break all of this down with the brilliant Julian Emanuel of Evercore. He's going to join us in about four minutes' time. From New York City, on TV and radio, for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.
think in the next three to four months through the rest of this year, it's going to be a really volatile time. You have to be opportunistic. You have to be patient. And you have to realize that this probably is going to go on for a bit. The Fed is going to face an increasingly more difficult challenge this time around. When they pause, you want to be very wary about the relief rally. You are fighting the Fed if you're bullish. It's hard to find anybody that's bullish now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Where did all the balls go? From New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramford, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures up a quarter of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up seven tenths of 1%. TK, we have a bounce. Will it stick? It's a bounce, and the data really speaks volumes. We've had, you know, I get the equity bounce and all that with the VIX 26.21 shows it's not too much agony. But the two-year yield, John, earlier this morning, that's a big deal. And the Japanese yen tells me this is a global global coordinated system into September. Yesterday, good news was bad news, Lisa. This time around this Friday, if we get bad news, is that just bad news? Well, not necessarily. I mean, basically, if you get a disappointing jobs number, does it give a, a bit of a relief to people who are expecting that perhaps it's a 75 basis point rate hike by the Federal Reserve in September? That said, what are we really looking at here? Right now, you were just talking about this before, John, longer term inflation expectations are actually tumbling since Fed Chair Jay Powell's speech. People believe that they are going to get inflation under control much more significantly. And that's perhaps why you're seeing a little bit more of a lift in tech stocks because people are seeing well, perhaps there's more of a case for those in a slow growth kind of environment where yields uh, eventually go back down. I think they've all been sent the same hymn sheet, haven't yeah. they? Because they've all been singing from the same one. Same Tom, one. over the last couple of days, they've said the last, the last couple of days, they've said the same thing. Raise and hold and hold for maybe a year, perhaps even longer, Tom, than that. And that's been the forceful message of this Fed over the last week <clears> or so. Well, that's the Fed parlor game. And I, I'm sorry, John, the data matters. But, John, let's be clear as we go into the jobs day. And really, this is the beginning of the study of Friday's jobs. Does ADP this morning matter for Jerome Powell? I don't think so. It's a strange one, that one, Tom, because yeah. if you ask people if ADP matters, Lisa, they'll turn around and say, no, it doesn't. And then sometimes we end up trading on it. Then once you get to Friday, ADP no longer matters. Okay. Just focus on payrolls. I think it's fascinating that because we've all been saying that ADP doesn't matter, ADP took a break and they said we're not going to put out data for a couple of months and now they're coming back and they're saying now it matters. So let's see what happens and let's see whether that data tracks a little more closely. It might be a pivotal moment. This might be a really exciting it, day. It may well be. Or not. Probably not. <laughs> Do you think I could take a break like ADP? <laughs> How many I mean, months was that? A couple of months? A couple of months. Yeah, nice. yeah. To reassess. Nice. You're going to rejigger your methodology? Yeah, sure. Do data and start with Sterling. You wanted me to start with Sterling start right with now? Sterling. Okay. I, think I, I was going to start deal. with equity, so let's do that, Tom, because the team's not ready to fire up Sterling just yet. So I'm futures up, up two tenths of 1% on the S&P. And then that's that 100 up around six or seven tenths of 1%. Euro dollar 99.83 with negative a third of 1%. So that's a weaker euro in the mix. And we've talked about pound sterling a couple of times this morning. We have. Lisa, 116.20, yeah. negative a third of 1%. Hiking into weakness, and that weakness is the more prevalent story, especially as we look at some of the potential projections for inflation in that region. 18% over at Citigroup, whether or not that's just a marketing ploy, will have to be uh, debated later on the show. Today, Nord Stream 1 goes offline for three days for maintenance. Maybe it's longer. That is the question whether Russia is going to stop exporting natural gas to Europe. But we are seeing a little bit of a lift to natural gas prices. But yesterday and the day before, huge decline in natural gas prices. And I think this was really underpinning some of the attempt at a bullish feeling, at least to start the trading day, as people took a look at a, a concerted effort by EU members to get some sort of structure for the electricity markets, but also stockpiles rising faster than they had previously expected. 8.15 a.m., do we care? I guess we'll be parsing that through ADP, putting out their numbers after uh, taking a break for a couple of months. How much is their new methodology making it more relevant in giving a sense of what we can expect on Friday with the jobs report? Yesterday's JOLTS data was much more important than people had previously thought. It was JOLTS Tuesday because we saw that oh, those openings climb in a way that people were not expecting. Now nearly two job openings per every so unemployed that American. That signals that there still is a lot of momentum behind wage gains, right? That is the concern, is that this is going in the opposite direction of what the Fed wants to see. This is not labor market weakness. This is the Un exact American opposite. This is a big concern for some people, even though it's good news, right? So this is why good news is bad news. Today, Fed speak continues, lots of it. We've been hearing a 
lot from Fed speakers. Will they give us any new insight or will they just continue singing from the same hymn sheet? Loretta Mester, Cleveland Fed President, Lori Logan, Dallas Fed President, Raphael Bostic, Atlanta Fed President, all lining up to give a sense of what they're looking for. I'm still looking for some insight, John, on the balance sheet and how that's going to potentially yes. affect things. So am I. Are we calling this ADP Wednesday? Yeah, ADP Wednesday. No, not. It's not going to stick, is it? That's not going to stick. Tuesday. Oh, a tots Wednesday. It's not going to work. Lisa, thank you. Julian Emanuel is with us, Chief Equity and Quantitative Strategist at Evercore RSI. Julian, you call this the gray zone. What on earth is the gray zone? The gray zone is, look, we had a reasonably epic bear market from January to June uh, that was not only the epitome of don't fight the Fed, but the markets took the hawkish narrative and ran with it in an unprecedented <laughs> way, causing, you know, if you look at the stock bond quadrant, uh, you know, the biggest losses in the combined 60-40 portfolio that we've seen in mm -hmm. years. And then it all turned uh, in uh, June and into a few weeks ago. Uh, and now we're at a point where uh, do we go back to the don't fight the Fed mantra uh, or do we think about it and we think about mm -hmm. the, the unfolding, you know, perhaps the Fed easing off, which is not at all in the script right now, right. even though people are well, discounting that, that next that, year. This is important. To that point, in the last 22 hours, we've heard here David Rosenberg and Luke Tilly of Wilmington Trust both scream the disinflation story, Edward Hyman screams. Ed Hyman says we're going from 8-ish, 9-ish, and we're going down not to 2, but we're going to 4%. What does your world do if we get an Ed Hyman disinflation? Stocks do well. Stocks absolutely oh, come on. do what well. John, no, help they, me no, here. They, do they do double digit well? Like, do they roar? Not in this environment, not yet, because the likelihood is that if that happens, Ed's view of 1% GDP is probably where we are in 2023. And that's still a constrained environment. But I want to make a point here. Please. Okay, you've got three Fed speakers today, okay? And if you think about it, going back to the first hike in March, Every time there was an extreme sort of market response to anything that Powell said, both either hawkish or dovish, the Fed speakers come out and have moderated the tone. It's going to be very informative Lisa, what they say. Can we today. get him on every day or like every <laughs> other day? I mean, just to lighten it up. <laughs> your people can talk to his people. So far, Julian, to your point, the other Fed officials have absolutely doubled down. They have not watered down Jay Powell's message at all. They've gone quite the other way. How does that inform your assertion, which is rather dramatic, that the growth-led rally is over? You're basically uh, reputing this idea that big tech can rally in the face of perhaps more economic weakness, even with a Fed that is determined to hike rates. Well, and again, it's surprising to the extent in the last couple of days how much the other Fed officials have doubled down. But what it does is it just when you when you look at yields, you know, they're going up uh, on the short end rates. But also, when you think about the fact that tomorrow we're going to start $95 billion a month in QT, it's hard not to make the case that yields on the long end are going up as well. And again, as we've seen in this positively correlated stock bond world, that's a massive headwind for stocks, particularly for growth stocks. What kind of downside are you seeing, Julian? <sighs> I would say the key here is... Does the consumer hold in in September? If you think about it, one of the anomalies of this year is that consumer sentiment has been absolutely abysmal the entire year, and spending has been fine. Obviously, that's one of the strangenesses about a new inflationary environment. But if you think about it, you know, could you get into this uh, idea, we're back to the office, we're back to school, September is, is challenged. That is the kind of environment, if the consumer holds in, we could be okay. We, you know, but if not, there's a potential retest of the lows in store. Well, this is the bigger question, Julian. It's not about whether inflation comes down to 4%. It's what price you're willing to pay to get inflation down to 4%. Where's unemployment? when inflation comes down to 4%. What's happened to GDP when inflation comes down to 4%? Julian, it's not that easy, is it, just to say we come down to 4%, that's good for stocks? No, not at all. And, and look, if we've learned anything this year, or I'd argue the last two and a half years, is that the tail outcomes, you know, when people talk about black swans, they happen a heck of a lot more frequently than we would have ever ex uh, imagined. And that's really what you've seen to a large extent 
this year. And and so, you know, there's a lot of different potential outcomes as we head into the fall. We're starting to try to stay super, super open-minded about this, Gillian. Can you help us do that? The short and shallow consensus around a recession in America. How are you and the team thinking about maybe the tail risks here? So, so we continue to think that you're not likely to have a recession, but if Ed's view of 1% GDP uh, next year is, is correct, and, and we see asymmetrical, uh, pardon me, symmetrical risk ar- around that number, it's still going to feel for asset markets from time to time as if there's a recession. That argues for higher volatility. And then again, you know, Ed said it a couple of days ago, it argues for humility in forecasts. As Ed sent out the memo, everyone get back to the office. Did he do a <laughs> well, There's a real question. Did he do a Solomon? As uh, he sent out the memo. You know, day after Labor Day, we're, 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 we're guns blazing. Get back in. The ties are back, I've noticed as well, Tom. Did you notice that? I've yeah. got a message. When Jan Hatsius was with us from Goldman, I noticed yeah. the tie was back. Yeah. But only after the interview. When was the tie ever out? I well, the tie was, yeah. the tie was out during the pandemic. pandemic. <laughs> Jan took it off. The bow tie's gone, Tom. The tie's yeah. gone. No, you know. Julian, thank you. It's good to see you in I person. I wore a tie thank last you. night to the Open. I noticed that. You're in a bow tie and... And your it's man from Del Monte suit. I to say, yes, the man from Del Monte showed up, up to the open. Did you catch up with Emma, Tom? No, I didn't. Uh, she's in a lot of pain, and to be honest, she can't hold the racket. It's that simple. She's the blisters on her hand. Blisters. Yeah, yeah, wicked, wicked. I mean, been not a, like... Been a problem for the last year. Two or three. It's like they, they had to take a break in the middle and put seven bandages on or whatever. Not good. She got crushed. Not good. I, I tell you what, there's something going on in the secondary market in the U.S. Open, in the U.S. Open and on the ticket front. There's just something, oh, I agree. There's something Total weird scam. going on. I got very lucky, John. There's something Full, really strange yeah, going yeah. on. If you have any theories, please send My them over. My theory is Reto emailed and said, did I buy this? They're and not I said, up 10, no. 20%. <clears throat> Some of these tickets have like quadrupled. Yeah, yeah. No, you're but right. There's something really odd going on yeah. in the secondary market. Absolutely. Ticketmaster, we want a conversation with you when you're available. Yeah. <laughs> Features up two tenths on to the report, S&P eh? <laughs> from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Inflation in the Eurozone has set another all-time high. Consumer prices in 19 country currency block rose 9.1% in August from a year ago. That beat the median estimate in a Bloomberg survey of economists and it strengthens the case for the European Central Bank to consider a jumbo interest rate hike when it meets next week. The Justice Department says White House records held in a storage room at Donald Trump's Florida home may have been moved before an FBI search in June. The Justice Department says that could have been an attempt to obstruct the investigation. In a filing, there was a photo of files labeled top secret said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. And shares of Bed Bath & Beyond are plunging. The struggling home goods retailer said in a filing that it may sell an unspecified number of shares from time to time. Bed Bath & Beyond is holding a conference call today to provide what it calls a business and strategic update. And those shares of Snap also falling today. According to The Verge, the parent of Snapchat plans to lay off about 20% of its nearly 6,500 employees starting today. The stock already has fallen almost 80% this year. Snap has been struggling with a slowdown in advertiser spending. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Decline in the gas price closing in on a dollar twenty off of its peak per gallon uh, in mid June. That's a trend. I mean, that's been well over two months now. So that's been having some momentum, and we expect it to have more. That was Jared Bernstein of the White House. Big move, three eighty now. The average price of gasoline in the United States of America, middle of June. A lot happened in the middle of June, didn't it? June thirteenth, more than five dollars a gallon was the average. Brutal stuff. Tom Keen, Lisa Bramitz, and Jonathan Ferro. Futures right now positive. 
two tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100, Price up six over. tenths of one percent. Yields up three or four basis points, 314 on a 10 year. Yeah. Crude lower by 2.7 percent, 89.15, but the epicenter of the price action right now, foreign exchange. 99.90 on euro dollar, negative a quarter of one percent yeah. with the hawkish speak from the Bundesbank this morning, off the back of an upside surprise on CPI, north of 9 percent going into an ECB meeting where we're talking about not 50, possibly 75 basis points on the table for the ECB next week. And sterling breaking down as well. 116.23. Cable time, negative a third of 1 percent. Yeah, the drift function in uh, currency this morning is really not pretty. I just looked at a fancy chart on sterling, John, and, and I, I won't mince words. Uh, it's grim. John, we've got to get out front of the real yield. The real yield has very quietly moved up. It's not out to new high, but the 10-year real yield in America is an unspoken story at the end of this summer. I think it was Lisa's chart the last 24 hours, Tom, yeah. to be fair. Well, she's out front of, you know. Well, she's out front of everyone yeah, on Twitter. I mean, you know. Bremo, what a move that's been. Yeah, it's been dramatic. And how much is that what's underpinning the move that we've seen in equities? This is a reassessment of how far the Fed will go, how much pain <clears> they're willing to inflict on an economy to get inflation under control. Tom, if you were to back to June highs, the stock's below belong at June lows, and that's something we're going to well, have to discuss. Well, that's the theory, and we'll see if that's the, the exception of the rule. S&P at 4,000 exactly. Jack Fitzpatrick now on Washington. Jack, the silly season starts. In the old days, politicians kissed babies. How do they reach out to voters now? Give us a social media or advertising update on the crazy messages we're going to see on the dash to November. Uh, you know, in terms of crazy messages, especially that speak to the modern era of campaigning, uh, the Pennsylvania Senate race has been very interesting, a bit surprising. You've seen uh, Mehmet Oz, the Republican uh, nominee, Dr. Oz, go after uh, John Fetterman, the Democrat, a couple times. Uh, talking about his health, Fetterman had the stroke and, you know, yeah. there was a, a Twitter ad that Oz put out uh, using the word crazy, saying he'd, he'd kind of lost it and implying he had not fully recovered from it. It's the kind of thing that previously you would have thought they'd hope that a super PAC independently would do, that kind of attack, you wouldn't want your name on it. Uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. There, there's some surprise that Oz has, has uh, taken that line a couple times now. Uh, but yeah, social media, uh, especially pandemic and post-pandemic, there's a huge uh, focus on social media and what you can do with that and how that undermines some traditional thoughts about fundraising and how that plays <coughs> into campaign strategy. Uh, but P the Pennsylvania Senate race is probably my, my favorite uh, strange yeah. example of that lately. Uh, Jack, what's so important here is the stereotype is the Republicans have money, the Democrats don't. Am I right that that's not true this time around? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, for a, a while now, Democrats, uh, Democrats really were the first to use uh, social media and sort of the modern internet as a, a means of big time fundraising. Uh, the, the Obama, first Obama campaign was out earlier than Republicans on that. Uh, and a lot of this has been shaken up again with social media uh, and the 2016 race. Trump self-funding to a significant degree uh, and relying on social media more than, you know, TV advertisements. Uh, if you remember 2016, Jeb Bush's people were talking about shock and awe, hoping that they could raise so much money that even Marco Rubio wouldn't dare to run. Obviously, that was not the case. And so uh, the presence of social media and, and the digital strategy mm -hmm. and the prominence of that has made it totally, totally different than uh, the, the traditional fundraising focus that was in place for a long time. Jack, before we let you go, we have to really mark a moment that we kind of missed, which is that the pandemic is officially over. That seems to be what the new CDC guidance has been saying. And that certainly is the case with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley saying, get back to work. You don't have to test. If you're not vaccinated, cool. You don't have to wear a face covering. And oh, by the way, if you're exposed to somebody who's positive, just wear a mask. If you get sick, wear a mask. I mean, it basically is. It's your responsibility, not a public health concern anymore. Is this a watershed moment? Uh, I don't know about a watershed moment, but we have been inching toward uh, a, a time period in which 
medically the pandemic would not be over and it's it's not it, it, it's not gone it's we've still got much a, a much more significant issue on our hands than something like the seasonal flu uh, but the you know medical professionals and politicians I think had the sense that there would not be a hard end there wouldn't be a mysterious disappearance uh, of the virus uh, like has happened at, at times the the Spanish flu for example and they were going to have to make some decisions about out when to a little bit ignore it and that raises hard questions about funding for vaccines what the US's role is internationally how seriously they take that uh, the the last six months or so has been uh, just a series of examples of uh, lawmakers taking the the push for vaccine test funding that kind of thing less and less seriously until it just kind of fell off the table uh, so we we have gotten to the point where there's a significant delta between the the medical reality that it's still there yeah. but the political and cultural willpower to take very significant steps that people have gotten tired of Jack thank you Jack Fitzpatrick there down in DC Bramo I think Goldman Morgan Stanley hoping hoping it's over it's get back to work in a big way isn't it get back to the office it's basically there's enough remedies and there's enough uh, collective immunity that you'll be fine. And if you're not fine, well, then we'll just have to deal with that as a potential consequence. And that seems to be the zeitgeist, to use Tom's word, of, uh, frankly, the nation. Because sure. people are, are sick of it. They just want to get back to some sort of sense of normalcy. And slowly but surely, you're seeing that around the country. And you certainly see businesses say, look, if you can come in and go to the, the city to go out to eat or go to a show, you can come back to the office. I think bosses are sick of it. Let's be very Clear Thank about you, that. John. John. Can I just say, can I just say this? I'm not going to pick on any individual bank, but sort out the office, maybe. Just sort out the booths that people I, have, I to have to sit in. I have to be careful, John. Tom, here. and make it more comfortable <laughs> if you want them to come back Welcome from the home to office. The architectural channel. I'm also I'm just the saying, shopping channel. I'm just saying. Also, John, the good work of the doctors that life. we had through the COVID. Yesterday, 473 people died. To me, that's a little elevated as an amateur, but still. It seems to be a number that's trending up ever so slightly of the 1.04 million deaths uh, that we've had. John, to Jack's perfect statement, the science and the politics is miles apart. And John, to your point, a lot of companies are doing that. They're rejiggering their offices to make them look make more it, exciting. Make it nicer. But that's actually what's happening. I don't know how you make it more exciting. We're going against the trend, folks. Soon, how'd you, how'd you surveillance. Make it more exciting? All of us together. Well, we're going back home, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> going against the trend and going back home. Futures up a third on the S&P from New York. This is Bloomberg. If the pandemic is over, are we allowed in the same room, Tom? Are we going to figure that I'm, out? I've been lobbying for it, John. Can, I've been lobbying make, for it. We can make that happen. That's when Good. I know the pandemic is truly over. We'll share our team. Well, we're allowed to sit together for the first time in like two and a half years. Yeah. Futures right now, positive, quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, up six tenths of 1%. The equity market bouncing back. I've talked about the losses over the last three days. Brutal losses over the last three days. Down about 5% on the S&P 500. Down a whole lot more on the Nasdaq. So a bit of a bounce back. A bounce back, though, after we've suffered over the last week off the back of what's happened in this market. The bond market, twos, tens and thirties. Your two-year yield taken out the higher the year, the June 14th close, yesterday at the close. And we add to it again this morning, up four basis points. Came very, very close to 350 on a two-year. Right now, 348.07. That move is supporting the US dollar as well, even though we're seeing moves across the Atlantic in Germany and the UK yield higher. We're seeing the currencies Weaker, weaker, weaker. The dollar index just off levels we haven't seen since 2002. Euro dollar just about holding on to parity, negative a tenth of 1%. Sterling came very, very close to a 115 handle, 116.35 right now, Tom, down two tenths of 1%. And if you look a month to date chart, look at a month to date chart of yields in the UK and Germany, you'll see this just massive moves. And yet, what have you seen in the currency? Weaker currencies. And that's the big dynamic, yeah. Tom, for these central banks looking to bring yeah. in bring in big-time inflation prints. John, take 30 seconds on Italy, 8.2% survey. Wow, 9% inflation. That's distant. A look at headline in Europe, Tom, a nine handle for the whole yeah. of the Eurozone. And that's why the Bundesbank is pushing this idea <clears throat> of making a decisive move, saying that they shouldn't fear a recession, 
Well, we now assume, Tom, they're going to have a recession and they're going to hike aggressively into it. You have to bear in mind, Tom, you mentioned where CPI is in Italy and Germany, where it is in the Eurozone. Rates are still at 0%. And that tells you why the CCB and many of the hawks on it are looking for a big move come next week. No, yeah, I, I, I go with that, but I, I just sorry. Europe is unique, and I think it's underplayed, John. There's a war going on. We, There's a war know, going we've on. We've forgotten that in August. We've said that repeatedly, and we're going to feel the consequences of that war for a long time. Yeah. So, Tom, if you've got a supply side problem and you're trying to address that with interest rate hikes, does it make sense that we're only talking about a short and shallow recession? Well, that's because they could be chasing their tail for a long, uh, long time I, trying to get that down. I think the, the combination of those dynamic parts, John, is when does the Fed see enough data or another central bank where they ease up on the idea we've got to get to a real rate regime we're comfortable with? And like Rosenberg. Julian Emanuel, Ed Hyman, and others are saying this is going to be the surprise of September. What's the price they're willing to pay to get inflation down? One, how much pain are they willing to tolerate? Same point. Do they that's, get that's the issue? Tom. Do they get inflation down, or does it decline itself? If that's the case, that's a beautiful thing, and risk is off to the races. Do you think that's going to happen? I, I'm not going to predict it. I don't think that's the base case right now. I'm not right going to predict. That's not the consensus view. I'm not in a predictive mood. I think you're in a better position to predict that game, Tom. At the moment, versus this. Well, Possibly. I got to go with the Tots because Nate Shelley. You know, I mean, the West Ham's been off. Yeah, Nate of Ted Lasso, who manages West Ham in Maybe a fictional Tuttle come sense over and, help. and not in a, not in the real world. Tom. Anyway, that's the cross asset price action. Lisa is very tolerant. Very patient. <laughs> She's very standing patient. by. Hi, Lisa. I'm, hi, I'm She's watching transitory. you guys. I'm listening to you guys discuss your uh, theoretical road trip to a uh, fantasy show in, that has to do Thank with you. football. It sounds really illuminating. What I'm watching is actually to this point of short and shallow. One of the reasons behind <laughs> this conviction has been because of the strength of the consumer, the strength of the balance sheet of both companies as well as individuals in the United States more than other places. HP reported earnings yesterday after the bell. Fascinating. Downgrading their uh, forward. Uh, of forecasts as a result of less demand for personal computers and printers, also seeing less demand from companies as well. This has been a consistent theme. We've seen this in semiconductors and we have seen this in the hardware companies. How much does this portend something bigger versus just all of these people bought all of their computers during the pandemic and don't need them now? Bed Bath & Beyond shares are absolutely tumbling after this company filed to sell more shares at an unspecified time in an unspecified amount. Those shares down nearly 18% in pre-market trading and Snap shares down 7% or nearly 7% after Verge yesterday reported that this company is going to be cutting 20% of its 6,500 person workforce. How much does this portend ongoing job cuts, right? We've been seeing this in some of the tech companies. Snap, of course, so do the social media companies getting hit by a lack of advertising. Something to watch. How much is this a, an anecdotal story versus something more mainstream? I'm also watching the energy sector because what we are seeing is the third monthly decline of losses in the the oil space of declines in the oil space which is the longest streak of losses going back to 2020. We are seeing this reflected in the prices uh, of some of these shares. Exxon down 2%, uh, Chevron 2.3%, Devon Energy 2.7% ahead of the open and pre-market trading. How much is this the ongoing trend that will turn out to be wrong? And Tom, this is what we keep hearing from people. They're selling energy to raise some cash to go into perhaps yeah. small caps or other more beaten up yeah. areas. How much uh, is that really going to be the theme heading into winter as you see increased demand and possibly just the lack of supply to meet that, given yeah. some of the international constraints. The international is what I would look to. To me, I, I, you can't guess why. There's some surveys that were done, uh, Lisa, pushing 30, 40 years ago that it's the toughest market to predict. I mean, it's just energy is just totally agree. a nightmare uh, to totally predict. Agree. Right now, we're going to look at the bond market. We're going to look at the end of September. It's been so quiet. What's it like? Well, it's like Rip Van Winkle, except we're going to call it Rip Debt Winkle. Because that's what it is. It's been asleep. Deborah Cunningham wakes us up for September. Global liquidity markets uh, officer at Federated Hermes. We're thrilled she could join us this morning. What do CFOs do in September? I get the idea. Equities. Everybody comes back. They recalibrate. Blah blah blah. What do CFOs do about the issuance of uh, uh, bills, notes, and bonds come September? Well, I think they look at what the plans are for the rest of the year, where they're going into the next year, and decide on short term, long term, how much, um, you know, in in what sectors right. of the market they're issuing. Do they? So I think we'll, we'll Does, see debt come come into the marketplace. I, I agree. Robert Schiffman has a stunning essay out on Amazon at Bloomberg Intelligence this morning of the financing that they could do for a 
$100 billion possible transaction just to get the firepower. In your world, is a lot of debt going to be issued just to get the firepower ready? You know, I think there have been companies that have um, have have already termed out some debt, taking advantage of what they think are the shortest or the lowest rates that are going to be, um, you know, available to them for a while as inflation continues to be an issue. Um, but I don't think it's everyone. I think you still got, you know, asset backed issuers. I think you have corporates. I think you have financials that are all looking still for additional debt financing in the short term sector, as well as maybe the you know, short to intermediate uh, area of the bond curve over the next, um, over the rest of this year and into 2023. Deborah, you've got a front row seat into one of the biggest questions in markets coming up, particularly starting this week with the acceleration of the runoff in the balance sheet and what that will do with respect to the removal of liquidity in markets, how much that will inject volatility uh, into a lot of the banking sphere in particular. What's your view in terms of what you're seeing on the ground with liquidity exiting certain aspects? of the market that really have been fueling some of the frothier areas? Well, certainly, you know, it's been going on since June. Now it's going to double, you know, starting next month, starting starting tomorrow. Um, and it's been masked by other issues in the economy. So, you know, what we have seen so far from a roll-off of Treasury and mortgage-backed securities has already been overshadowed by the increasing rate environment that we've experienced and the sell-off in those securities um, in response to that. Uh, you know, the expectation would be as they double it, you're looking at something that has an impact of probably another 25 or 50 basis point like tightening by um, by the FOMC. And as such, you know, wh wh where 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 are the buyers? Who are the buyers? Um, we have from at least a Treasury perspective, however, been in, you know, sort of a supply demand imbalance where there hasn't been enough in supply in the marketplace. So it's really going to be welcomed, I think, to a, some degree for, you know, the most highest quality Treasury securities in the marketplace. From an MBS standpoint, there may be a little bit more resistance, but it's smaller volume there as well. Deborah, got to leave it there. Thank you. Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes. Um, got to leave it there because we've got some news from Bed Bath & Beyond. Let me tell you this. We've got some news. It's just headline after You're headline. You're shopping there this weekend? To close 150 yeah. stores. Jobs getting cut as well, Lisa. A reduction in the workforce. A big reduction in the workforce. Just going through some of these numbers. Yeah. Bramo, what do you see? Well, also discontinuing three of nine of their labels. This comes after weeks of speculation around this company about them being able to raise financing. They just filed uh, a document earlier this morning saying that they would raise an unspecified amount of money in an unspecified uh, amount of share sales at different times. They didn't really give any details to that. But this really highlights a problem, especially as some of their suppliers cut off deliveries because they were worried about late payments. Uh, these are some of the issues facing a company that that's been struggling for a while, but how much while. can it uh, rise above that, especially since it was a meme stock darling and had been able to All raise right. money that way? Well, that speaks sure. to the big move this morning, down about 25%. So second quarter comp sales decline about 26%. They see full year comp yeah. sales down in the 20% range. So that's pretty tough going. And on the share sale you're talking about, Bramo, to sell up to 12 million shares in an offering, the offering proceeds to be used, Tom, to buy back John. debt. Is this a zombie company? I say that with respect for the hardworking people in management and on the line at Bed Bath & Beyond. Bed Bath & Beyond, total return per year for 20 years, negative 4% per year, total return the last 10 years. Think of what they missed, John, versus other retailers. Home Depot is the icon, negative 14% per year. If this def defines zombie company, why doesn't it restructure a la Milken transaction? Well, this feels like a kitchen sink type morning for the company, Lee, so that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, especially because they're trying to potentially raise money in the equity market to buy back shares. That's going to be terrible for the equity. That's why you're seeing such a big response, whether they'll actually be able to do it. Is anyone going to buy it? Good question. Down 26% in the pre-market and falling off the back of a range of headlines we'll keep you up to speed on. From New York City with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramberts and Jonathan Farrow. We have a bounce just about on the S&P up two tenths on the Nasdaq 100, on behalf of 1%. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. More revelations in the probe of those classified documents found at Donald Trump's Florida home. In a court filing, the Justice Department suggests there may have been attempts to obstruct the investigation by moving some of the papers. The filing included a photo of files labeled top secret, said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. Europe faces the risk of blackouts, rationing and a severe recession if Russia slashes gas deliveries further. And the next reality check is at hand. Starting today, there'll be a halt in gas sent through the Nord Stream pipeline. It's a key source of energy for the EU. There's a concern that Moscow will find another excuse to clamp down on those supplies. And prices in British shops rose this month at the highest rate since at least 2005. According to the British Retail Consortium, shop price inflation increased to 5.1% in August. The price of food rose even more, 9.3%. Shoppers are doing everything they can to save money at the checkout, and that includes buying less food. And Bloomberg has learned that Credit Suisse's board is divided on the fate of its troubled investment bank just before crucial meetings. One camp is pushing back against an aggressive downsizing. Others are in favor of more extensive cuts. After racking up billions of dollars in losses, Credit Suisse is taking aim at the investment bank, which has been at the heart of some of its biggest troubles. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. At European level, we have agreed that all member states to do jointly save 15% of energy between August now and March 23. And here's good news. We have reached now an average in the European Union of storage filling of 80%. That is some good news. That was from Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president. It's good news because the original target was 80% by November 1st. And it's the end of August, so there you go. Just a little bit of good news out there in Europe. Live from New York City this morning, a good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Brabbit. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures bouncing back, kind of, on the S&P by not even two-tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100, up 62 points, up a half of 1%, a yield wow. to higher by two or three basis points, 313. Not going to neglect this. I think we have over the last 90 minutes or so, but crude and 88 handles. We're breaking down there yeah. by 2.9%, <clears> 88 95. There were some concerns about supply out of Iraq. I think Iraq has calmed down those concerns about supply out of Iraq. And then on the horizon for the last, I think, 12 months at least, this idea, Lisa, that maybe, just maybe, there is a deal from Iran. But I feel like we've been talking about that forever. Uh, this, to me, is a recession call. It's basically higher prices that are cannibalizing demand. And the more that the, uh, the, uh, that, that the world slows down, particularly led by China, the less demand there will be. And that's what's leading to lower prices. That's been sort of the theme over the past three months. I'm with you. Demand destruction, Tom. Back I on the table. I, I think the jury's out. And I, I link it to the COVID policy of Asia. If they change their COVID policy... Maybe you get an Asia boom, as some have written about some of the optimism, Jay Pulaski, J.P. Morgan, and others on the Pacific at Rim. We get an oil update on your next gallon of gas with Will Kennedy, senior, excuse me, your next gallon of petrol. Will Kennedy joins senior executive editor, Commodities, uh, in uh, London. Will, there's a tone out there from a select few of a potential global disinflation for all the other matters out there. Is oil, is the Will Kennedy world linked to the possibility of a global disinflation, or is oil separate? Uh, I don't think it's uh, separate at all. I think that the oil is being put under pressure by a lot of different things, some of which uh, John just mentioned there, <coughs> geopolitical things. But the thing that's really putting under pressure, uh, the prospect of higher rates and uh, a stronger dollar. The stronger dollar has proved a huge headwind for yeah. oil and is one of the things that stopped it uh, getting traction. Um, but the other thing I want to say about the oil market is it remains hugely volatile. We're getting these big swings. The Saudi oil minister intervened in the market last week to say to people, look, don't write us off. We're willing to cut production if we need to. That sent oil up as high as 106 for Brent. 
we're $10 uh, below that now. And it's interesting to me that Pierre Anderan took to Twitter this morning uh, just to say that in his view, the oil market is broken, that these moves don't make sense. They're not fundamentally driven. They reflect uh, a lack of liquidity in the market. And it's, it's quite hard to, to read oil from a fundamental perspective right now because a lot of people aren't totally sure of the price signal. Who's the country you're watching? Yeah. Who's the marginal player, OPEC yeah. plus, OPEC minus, the United States, all the rest of it? Who's the country that is a decider of oil dynamics into September? I think there are four things we need to watch, Tom. Sorry for the slightly long answer. China, as you mentioned, the huge driver of demand. Russia, we've got uh, more sanctions coming on oil at the end of the year. What will that do to production? Will they be able to sell more oil to Asia and less to Europe? Saudi Arabia, how do they respond to this market? Do they follow through um, on the threat of cuts? And finally, the USA. There are two things to watch in America. Firstly, uh, we're about to stop withdrawals from the SPR, which has been a huge source of comfort to the market, putting that uh, oil into the market. And shale isn't growing as fast as people expected. There's a very interesting column from uh, my friend Javier Blas this morning about how expensive pipe is getting in the shale patch, and that's, that's dampening growth. Um, so we've got to keep an eye on those four countries, uh, I think, as we look to the market into the end of the year. Well, we often probe this particular topic, but let's do it again. Can you frame how difficult this winter is going to be and the decisions that some of these governments still haven't made that they need to make in the next few weeks? Well, I think it's instructive just to give you some examples from the UK, actually, where people are starting to realise just how catastrophic their bills are going to be. And businesses in particular who are more exposed to free market prices than households in some respects, we're seeing all these stories of people running cafes, pubs, and they're facing bills that are going up five times. And frankly, people are saying, how can I operate my, base, my businesses on that basis? And they're saying, without some form of government help, I'm going to fold. So I think you're starting to get a picture about how this could really impact the wider economy. And if these energy prices are left unchecked for small businesses, for consumers in the UK and other European countries, it's going to have a catastrophic economic impact. And I think what we're watching is how governments respond in the UK, how the new prime minister we get next week responds, because I think it's going to need a big policy intervention. Well, there's a plan, uh, some, some plan to bring down the prices of electricity, uh, an emergency uh, combating of the very high prices. That's what we learned from Ursula von der Leyen this week when she gave a speech about what the European Commission is doing to collectively address the issue. Do you understand what this plan is? I think there are two parts to the plan. I don't think anyone fully understands it now. They haven't yet, they haven't sketched out the precise details, but there are two, perhaps two potential components, one which may have an impact in the shorter term and one which is slightly longer term. In the shorter term, there's some talk of a price cap, a, a, an, a, an attempt to cap the price of electricity, which got completely out of hand earlier this week, crossing a thousand euros a megawatt hour in Germany, uh, unimaginable prices previously. Now that cap, obviously, would still require someone to pay the market price. So actually what it is, is a way of sharing the burden. Would the difference go on government balance sheets? Would it be shared between industry consumers and the state somehow? I think those details are yet to be worked out, but clearly it would be a, an intervention that breaks the market mechanism for a period of time and, and sh shares the burden a bit differently. Then there's a second thing. At the, at the moment, the price of electricity in Europe as in many markets around the world, is set by the marginal cost of supply, what the most expensive uh, uh, unit of power you need to balance the market is. And that's traditionally, uh, that's natural gas right now, which is hugely expensive, as you know. Now, the thinking is there's a lot of power which is nuclear, which is renewable, which costs a lot less to produce. So is there a way of delinking power prices from natural gas prices, perhaps by having some kind of price that averages the cost of production. Now, this is complicated technical stuff. It would have to be done in a way that the market still gets the signals it needs to balance the market to have enough generation. But it's something that people are taking a serious look at. But to be honest, it would take a year, maybe two years for that to happen. It's not a short term fix. Well, great to catch up, sir. And we're looking forward to catching up again because we're no expert on any of this and we need your expertise to break down just what's going to happen. Will Kennedy there out of London policy intervention to try and tackle some of this stuff. What are we talking about? We're talking about fiscal intervention. Now, in a world of low rates, QE, and low inflation, that might make sense. In a world of high rates, QT, and high inflation, Lisa, I do wonder, in certain countries, how wide open the bond market is going to be for some of that, and whether the adjustment we're seeing in places like the UK 
is reflecting some of that angst at the moment. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. And one of the most important conversations that I think we've had over the past few weeks is with Francesco Bianchi uh, of uh, the, the paper presented at Jackson Hole talking about how fiscal stimulus gives the expectation for more inflation for a rescue to come in and that that really combats a lot of what the central banks are trying to do. That's a bigger deficit that you've got to finance yeah. in places like the United Kingdom. That's a topic we'll continue to discuss with people like Dan Morris of BNP Paribas. He's going to be joining us shortly from New York City, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. I do think it's optimistic to suggest that the Fed will be able to navigate positive activity anytime soon. I think in the near term, expect some choppy sessions. There's a Fed call in the sense that any good news gets taken away by the Fed's need to tighten. The supply side is finally taking hold and creating the disinflation. It's really hard to see that we avoid some sort of global recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. The last day of August, the beginning of September, the beginning of autumn. Turmoil in the equity markets, greater turmoil in the foreign exchange markets. And John, Lisa and I just want you to understand Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour, and on and on to nothing gold can stay. We quote Robert Frost, Lisa, fall is upon us. Yes, it is. You're going to throw that one to me? I was hoping that John would have to uh, punt oh, I'm not, that one. I'm not picking up on He's that like, one, no, I'm going to let you keep going. Us. Okay, we had a That's debate in the break that I'm actually excited for winter, and John is not excited for winter, and Tom, you're not waiting John, in. are the markets excited for winter? And boy, is this a turmoil time for the Fed. I've said it a few times. I think winter arrived early in this market. We've wiped out the gains yeah. for August. In the last three days, we're down <clears> about 5% on the S&P 500. Don't fight the Fed seems to be the message, and fighting the Fed means being bullish right now. That's why so many people are finding it difficult to be bullish. Yesterday we found out good news is bad news. Consumer confidence, decent. Job opening still elevated. Apparently that's bad news John, for this market because it means this Fed has more work to do. And the moment is right now, and I help you with this, John, under NI Fed, the gentlelady from Cleveland who we saw at Jackson Hole out with more uh, forward guidance, data dependency and the rest. And John, it is a certitude among Fed officials that inflation will not pull back. That seems to be the great tension. Raise and hold. Raise to what? Bramo, they're talking about a four handle. Hold for how long? Williams was talking about maybe a year through the whole of 2023. Yeah, but also she's saying that she sees unemployment above 4% by year end. This is the dual mandate that becomes more difficult. Uh, raising rates above 4% in early 2023, the market's still not pricing that in, right? They're getting up to 3.9% if you look at the Fed Fund's futures market, but you're not seeing that forehandle the way that she's putting out there. And then there still is the expectation for rate cuts. And Tom, this is what's striking to me. People are still saying, we don't buy it. You can keep saying whatever you want, but we still think they're gonna be rate cuts at some point later in 2023, or at least early 2024, as you recapitulate and, and look at that unemployment rate that rises. It's a stew that we're in right now. I mean, we make a joke about it, John, but Lisa's right. The toxic brew that's out there now is a desperation into September. There's few optimists out there. So the economists will focus on what's bad and what is good. Markets have got to think about what's better and what's worse. And Tom, what I want to understand is how markets are going to respond to this incoming information. And we often think about this. OK, there's the data. How's the market responding to it? Yesterday was an example where we got good economic news, consumer confidence, job openings. And yet it was bad news for this market because this Fed has to do more. Yeah. I want to know going into payrolls on Friday whether bad news is good news or whether bad news is just bad yeah. news. Because ultimately, the bad news in this labor market means payrolls are a little bit lower. It means unemployment is a little bit higher. It means wage growth starts to fade just a little bit too. And Tom, that's the objective of this Fed. Well, that's the objective. And the objective is going to be the news flow. Let's get to the new data. I'm going to do a data point, John. ADP in 12 minutes. ADP in 12 minutes. What's Bramo calling it? ADP Wednesday. 100%. It's not sticking. 
Futures up <laughs> a third of one percent <laughs> on the S and P. Yields higher by three basis right. points, three thirteen forty four. A lot of attention being paid to what's happening in the FX market with the euro dollar at parity. But for me and for Tom and for Lisa, very much about what's happening with pound <clears> sterling <throat> at the moment. Just breaking down to one sixteen, Tom. One sixteen yeah. twenty six. Watching foreign exchange closely. I agree with John. Uh, sterling is really quite interesting. Maybe also looking idiosyncratic Turkish lira. Actually, some stability uh, this week. Now, a brief into September. Daniel Morris joins us, Chief Market Strategist, BMP Paribas. Daniel, how does your September change things? What's the nuance launching from August into the autumnal September? Well, I think at this point, what's not going to change is we're going to have some hikes. And we focus a lot on is it 75? Is it going to be 50? The payrolls data will inform that. But we really should be focusing on the objective of the Fed, which is to get growth down, to get inflation down. Uh, and of course, the interest rate hikes are just a means to an end. So in one sense, it's a bit of a distraction. It's whatever it takes, if you will, uh, to get growth down and not only growth per se, but really to get the job market back into line, you know, with the recent JOLTS data, with the job openings, you know, rose over the previous month. And so you still have nearly 11 million job gap between what employers are looking for and what employees are available. That means, you know, continued high wage gains. That's going to fuel inflation. And that's just not sustainable from the Fed's point of view. Is that the environment that you want to be buying stocks in? For now, yes. So the real issue is going to be we all anticipate this you know, a recession next year, that that is what it's going to take to get inflation down. Uh, but that doesn't mean you should necessarily be allocating for that at this time. So overall, we're still neutral on equities uh, and have some markets that we favor. But at some point, yes, you are going to want to pivot. Uh, but we think it's really premature at this point to be doing that. And why is that? Why do you think it's premature? And typically, if you look at how markets react to recessions, it's really, you know, one, two, at most three months prior to when the recession starts that you start to see consistently negative returns for equities. You know, six months out, 50-50 chance. Uh, now, what's, of course, different this time is how much we all anticipate this recession, whereas <laughs> typically they often catch uh, us investors by surprise. So whether that time frame is going to be different this time, will that pivot happen sooner? More likely than not. But I think we're going to have to see more meaningful deceleration in the economy before that's likely to happen. Dan, is this really at all about the economy or is this about the Fed? I mean, yes, it's the economy, but the Fed wants to influence the economy lower. And Neil mm -hmm. Kashgari came out and said he was happy to see the market sell off in response to the Jackson Hole speech by Fed Chair Jay Powell and that he was disappointed to see the rally in previous meetings because this was not the goal. They wanted to see a tightening in financial conditions. How much can mm -hmm. you push against that with this sort of backward look to historical performance of equities in the face of recession? Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think what we're going to have to anticipate, you know, of course, on one hand, we do have rates going up. That's increasing the discount rate. So that should have a negative impact uh, on valuations for equities. We're not really seeing the growth impact yet. You know, we talk about earnings expectations still, you know, quite rosy for next year, 10 percent earnings growth year on year. And that's just something that's not compatible with the slowdown in growth that we think we're going to have to see. So it's that tension, you know, what's going to be the catalyst to bring those two back in line, of course, is the big question. But we believe it's going to happen at some point. It has to. Dan, what do you do with energy right now? Well, we are, broadly speaking, overweight commodities. I mean, on one hand, in anticipation of a recession, that typically is an environment for, for lower oil prices uh, because of lower demand, which uh, you know, certainly will still happen. But you know, we're in a different world when it comes to the supply right. side. We're not seeing that supply side response. And we think the net effect of those two forces is for us still to be overweight commodities. Dan, I looked at the Bloomberg Total Return All-In Global Aggregate Index today. And basically, with the price mm -hmm. decline yield up, we're back globally to where we were in 2011. State mm -hmm. the case for ownership of fixed income instruments. I don't get it. Well, you know, you want to look at it still from a portfolio perspective. I mean, clearly the big disruption in the first half of this year was the change in the correlations, the positive correlations between equities and bonds in a bad way with prices going down for both. Uh, you know, we appreciate we're going through this transition of the 30 year bull market in fixed income uh, to at least a bear market for a while. But, you know, at 3 percent or a bit more for treasuries, we're getting to the point where we should have a stabilization of rates. And then from a portfolio perspective, it's still going to make sense. So you know, right now, timing, we still anticipate higher rates for short duration. Uh, but we don't think we have anywhere as far to go as we did 
uh, over the last six months. Mm. Dan, just quickly, just to put a bow on it, how would you respond to a bad print on Friday? Is bad news bad news? Bad news good news? What is it? It's going to mean that the hike is 50 instead of 75. You know, it's good news relative to the 75, but it's still 50, and that's what's going to matter. Dan Morris of BNP Paribas John, Asset brilliant. Management. This Thank is, you, Dan. This is, John, what we've come down to. Trying to figure sure. out good news, good news, bad news, whatever the four box That's prisoners where we're at. Is. And once you Nuts. get a decent understanding of the reaction function of the Fed, you apply that to the incoming information and in the economic still don't data know what's going on. and try and work out what it means for this market. Yesterday, good news was bad news. I, End of story. I hate it, Tom. You hate it, too. I yeah. just wonder whether bad news is also just bad news. I, I think we'll be overcome by the facts. And I'm watching foreign exchange, John, all the different dynamics of... 10, 20, 30 pairs. This is really important, folks. John knows this. Is you don't just follow three pairs. That's not what the pros do. They look at all sorts of dynamics there. If I could follow one thing right now, though, it would be the UK. I think this is going to be a really interesting case study, Tom. You've got the energy crisis <clears throat> on the one hand, and I think we can call it that. I think it's fair to characterize yes, it as fair. an energy crisis. You've got the expectation that the government needs to offset that with fiscal policy. And you've got a big question mark as to whether the bond market is going to be wide open, available for them to do so. And if it's not, then what do you see? You see an adjustment naturally, Lisa. You'll see a weaker currency. You'll <laughs> see higher yields. What are we seeing at the moment? A weaker currency right. and yeah. higher yields. It's easy to make these kind of adjustments, yeah. this offset. If rates are low, yeah. central banks keep them pinned there, inflation's low, and you're doing QE. Right now, they're set to do QT, inflation's high, and they're raising interest rates. Different dynamic. In the prior era, there was the option for fiscal support, for fiscal spending, because rates were so low, because the w window was so wide open for uh, governments to borrow. That is flipped on its head. What do you get if you have fiscal policy moving in the opposite direction from monetary policy? If these two areas are in direct conflict with each other, who wins out? And ultimately, what happens with inflation? Sterling, Tom, just about 116. Yeah, the sterling is terrible. John, you know, I look at Emily Bronte, and she supported the tots years ago. I love September. Fall leaves fall, this die, flowers away, lengthen <laughs> night, and shorten this is day. All you. No, Go ahead. We've, we've got a break to take, I mean, unfortunately. John, <laughs> Tom, I'd love to talk more about the that. Poetry, the they poetry got the two, of September is, it, it brings tears to my eyes. The is up a third of 1%. For goodness sake. <laughs> New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The Justice Department says White House records held in a storage room at Donald Trump's Florida home may have been moved before an FBI search in June. The Justice Department says that could have been an attempt to obstruct the investigation. In a filing, there was a photo of files labeled top secret, said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. Inflation in the Eurozone has set another all-time high. Consumer prices in the 19-country currency block rose 9.1% in August from a year ago. That beat the median estimate in a Bloomberg survey of economists. And it strengthens the case for the European Central Bank to consider a jumbo interest rate hike when it meets next week. Shares of Bed Bath & Beyond are plunging today. The struggling home goods retailer has secured new financing and will close stores and slash its workforce. Bed Bath & Beyond faces a shrinking cash pile and is falling behind on payments to vendors. That's prompted some suppliers to halt or restrict shipments. Shares of Snap are falling today. According to The Verge, the parent of Snapchat plans to lay off about 20% of its nearly 6,500 employees starting today. The stock already has fallen almost 80% this year. Snap has been struggling with a slowdown in advertiser spending. And Mikhail Gorbachev is being remembered as the last leader of the Soviet Union who ended the Cold War. Gorbachev died Tuesday at a Moscow hospital. His attempts to shake up the Soviet Union's political and economic system led to the collapse of the communist superpower. Gorbachev's career disintegrated in the process. He was 91. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keen and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Do not shoot the messenger. Downside surprise on the ADP and um, bad news is 
good news. Equities up four tenths on the S&P, and, and the Nasdaq up eight tenths of one percent. Yields fade a little bit as well on a two-year, well-off session high. It's almost unchanged on the session now, up a basis point to 345.61. It's a downside surprise. It's 132. We were looking for 300k. This out on Twitter, Tom from Ivan the K. ADP unveils a new dartboard. There you go. That's like the latest that. ADP print. You like that? Mike McKee's with us too. Morning, Mike. <laughs> Good morning, John. Yeah, I'm the messenger, but I don't know what the message is here. ADP says this is a brand new survey. It's been completely retooled. It doesn't depend on models. It is a snapshot of the labor market during the month based on the payrolls that they process. <clears throat> and as you said, 132,000 jobs, 23,000 are in the goods producing sector, although there was no change in manufacturing jobs. And certainly Service providing jobs rise 110,000. Now, what does this mean for Friday? Uh, you listen to the ADP people, it says nothing. It's a standalone indicator, a unique snapshot of the economy. But I bet everybody on Wall Street right. is going to be plugging these numbers into their forecasts for Friday, which the consensus at this point is 300,000. They also, Tom, have a new report that is part of this report on pay. And according to this annual pay, a 12-month rate is was at 7.6 percent wow. rate of increase wow. in the month of August, which is high, right. but they say stabilized. Now, hard to know exactly what stabilized is because we don't have the back yeah. numbers. But uh, in theory, they're re uh, releasing those today. They've backcast this, yeah. and we'll see what it all. We'll try to put it all together for you. A nice lift to the market here. Nasdaq up 108 points. That gets my attention. Mike McKee, I won't mince words. This has been a busted data point for umpteen years. Mark Zandi tried to make make it work and others after Mark Sandy did. They went out and hired one of the best math guys in the world, Eric Brynjolfsson, with Andrew McPhee, uh, writing all sorts of things, including the second machine age. What is Professor Brynjolfsson of Stanford going to do to make the second ADP age? What's he going to bring to this? Well, basically, um, they're looking at large sources of data that can be trimmed down to a smaller point that uh, is useful to people. They say this is not model-based. This is based only on the ADP data. The Zandi versions were based on So they're on looking at the, the paychecks of America to get their data. Yes, in terms of uh, in, in terms of small, medium, large establishments, and they're breaking it down by industry sector. They're even breaking down the pay stuff by uh, the whether or not you're a job lever or a job stayer. It sounds a lot like the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, but we yeah. haven't. Uh, I mean, it's just come out, Lisa, so we'll have to. Uh, yeah, this, the two. this is the heart of the matter, Lisa, is that maybe now they're going to go to the actual data and not do, I mean, the, the, the diarrhea of data points and research points, empire this. I mean, Lisa, how many of these are there, these tertiary numbers? Empire this, Dallas manufacturing that. These tertiary numbers are important for people who are completely data dependent because the Fed isn't giving forward guidance, supposedly. Mike, is this ADP report powerful enough to move the dial and be relevant going forward? Is the new methodology enough of an overhaul to make it so that people don't just shrug this off being like, eh, it's ADP? Well, here's the thing. Uh, they retooled this because their model-based uh, previous surveys were designed to sort of preview what was going to happen in non-farm payrolls. Now they say it's not a preview. You can't extrapolate. But Probably people will try to do that, and then it'll depend on how close they come to the overall private sector job gains in the so no. non-farm payrolls numbers. So we're going to have to see how how this all works out over the longer run. I think Mike's being kind. <laughs> he basically Put like, it all together, Mike, no and, and thank you for your leadership in Jackson Hole. It was absolutely fantastic to see you with all the Fed presidents. What's the big takeaway for you, Mike? Because for many people, it's not September. It's not 50 or 75. There's something bigger happening here. Well, it's going to be the terminal rate and how long it takes to get there and then how long they hold it. Uh, the Fed is pretty much, all of them are pretty much agreed that they're going to get to a place above neutral and they're going to hold rates there. But there are disagreements about where that point is above neutral, whether it's 3.5, 3.75, 4% or higher. And there are disagreements about how long they may have to keep it there. But they are determined uh, to bring down inflation. And I think that's the message that uh, Jay Powell, on behalf of everybody, was trying to send on Friday. Mike, do you think they have sent a message in a convincing way 
that higher unemployment is a price worth paying for lower inflation. I've returned to that Chairman Powell speech from Friday a couple of times now, maybe four or five, and I was reading through it yesterday, and it was this word pain. He talked about pain, and I'll share the quote with everyone. Well, higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation. They will also bring some pain to households and businesses, but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. Mike, how convinced do you think the general public are of that? I don't know because I don't know how much attention the general public pay to the Fed, but through the markets, the markets seem to be buying into it, but uh, slowly. Uh, through the markets, people will see the impact, and maybe it starts to register. Uh, Powell did not say we're going into recession. He did not right. say unemployment is going to rise. You have to read between the lines, which everybody on Wall Street can do. And I don't know how many right. uh, the general public are actually paying that much attention, especially in August right. when their focus is on that last vacation before school starts. And with the leaves changing as well. Mike, uh, let me cut to the chase very quickly here. Ed Hyman's talking 4 percent inflation is where we're heading. What's the quote, as John mentions, what's the pain at a 4% inflation? Well, we've heard the Fed suggest that we get to a 4.1% a unemployment rate, which would mean a minimum amount of pain because the Fed believes that the natural rate of unemployment is 4.5%. So uh, it, it's hard to say. You get to 4% unemployment or uh, 4% uh, inflation, and maybe people start to feel a lot better. Look at what happened with the consumer confidence numbers yesterday because gas prices have fallen. They're still really high, but they've fallen, so people are feeling better. Mike, thank you, sir. Yeah. Mike McKee in the seat to go through that ADP print. A <clears throat> downside surprise ahead of payrolls on Friday, looking for something in and around 300K. It's pretty conventional wisdom in economics, Tom, but pretty controversial when the general public starts to hear this message that higher unemployment is a price worth paying. Oh, I don't inflation. think the public—John, I, 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 I feel the public doesn't buy it for one single sentence, the second. They're looking at these people going, are you nuts? That's why, and Tom, I think I'm, this becomes much more controversial when we actually start to see these numbers. And I go back to the comments from Senator Warren over the weekend to CNN. She's not going to be alone if unemployment starts to climb oh, totally and the Fed's agree. turning around every single news conference and saying okay, this is part but, of the plan. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything, John. Help me with the United Kingdom or Lisa, what you've read as well. What's the food kish, kitchen summary? We're making jokes. I'm making jokes about autumnal bliss, baloney. It's getting colder for a growing homeless population. Electricity period. prices and utility bills, I Lisa, don't... top of mind for everybody in Europe right now. Yeah, very much a very big concern. But just going back to this idea of the labor market and the pain there, there is this issue of the jolt survey, of the job openings. And this is sort of the soft landing scenario that if you take away some of the job openings, you won't necessarily get layoffs. You'll just sort of get this nirvana soft landing that will it's bring a beautiful it together. Thing. It is. I and, hope that's the case. You know, we all hope it's the case. I hope that's the case. Futures up a third of 1%. See, John, how Mike went to the S &P. autumnal illusion into September? Pretty sure you took him there. You was up a couple of I was just bullish, points. by the way. Did you just notice that? 31. Uh, the tone wasn't bullish, though. It was kind of like a, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, that's kind of, you know, no nah, 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 nah. <laughs>For about a second, five minutes ago, Lisa was almost bullish, except she said bullish things that went away. like it was a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> a, a tone matters here. Lisa, you, tone matters. No, you can't but just discount too. something that was bullish. That was but a you, bullish But thesis. if you make it sound like a fairy tale, once upon a time, job well. openings came down and unemployment didn't rise. <laughs> well, it is a fairy tale. <laughs> and rates didn't have to go that high. And growth stabilised, and everyone was happy, and there was a big bull market. Okay, so you're quoting fairy tales, and Sleep well. Tom is quoting Robert Frost. <laughs> Happy I've August. I've got no idea what he's quoting right now. I'm what a third I'm of 1% right now, come on, on John, we're moving from Bramo gloom time to Bramo standard time. On the NASDAQ, the up 7 tenths of 1%. <clears throat> Yield time by a couple of basis points, 312.31. If you can grab pound sterling, just looking at euro dollar with a break of parity at 99.91. Sterling, 116 and just about holding yeah. on as well. That currency pairs down four tenths of 1%. Earlier on this morning, I mentioned the comments from Charlie Bean to our team over in London, the ex-Bank of England deputy governor who talked about a risk premium that might have to return to the gilt market because of the ongoing deficit that we're seeing in the UK and the fact that it could get bigger because they need to offset the pain in the utility market, the energy market. And Stephen Gallo of BMO is picking up on this. And he's basically saying, we think it's also showing up in the currency. Now, Tom, if you worry about financing a deficit, as you know, you either need to attract investors with high yields or a weaker currency 
to get those international flows. And arguably, we're getting both right now. It's a difficult moment for the policymaker. It's a very, very different <clears throat> backdrop this time around to the fiscal effort yeah. that was supplied back in spring of 2020. It's, it's always a trilateral or three-pronged or three-legged stool, John. And I'm in the camp that foreign exchange really matters right now. And when you, you know, we're biased at Bloomberg on that because it's just so supple on the terminal. But, John, I'm sorry. It's speaking volumes. And what really interests me is Swissy has not strengthened. This is not a fear thing. It's not a Ukraine thing. This is an economic growth thing. And that's why you see UK historically, John, even as we do this section with a lease, we may get a 115 handle on Sterling. It's a policy thing, Tom. And yeah. policy in a lot of countries at the moment <clears throat> is in conflict with each other, right. fiscal monetary. We're just about holding on to 116 right now, Tom, on pound sterling against the U.S. dollar. To the labor economy of a beleaguered United Kingdom and certainly moving to Jobs Day on Friday, we begin and we thought we'd do something different this time, not with what's non-farm payroll is going to be, but far more the social aspects of our labor economy. The Economic Policy Institute, granted left-leaning, Democrat, Biden-favored, whatever you want to say, they have provided exquisite must-read research for conservatives on the social structure of the American labor economy. Elise Gold joins us this morning. Elise, I'm going to channel the good David Blanchflower up at Dartmouth College, and he has heeded, we've got it wrong, that it is a heterogeneous labor economy, and I'm going to use from John Edwards, two, three, or four Americas. What percentage of America is flat on its back? Well, that's it. Very interesting question. Um, I think that uh, you're right, that there are different stories of what is happening to people. When we think about the economy, we think about the labor market. Uh, overall, the unemployment rate has remained at 3.5%. That's quite low. We still are adding jobs every month that are pulling more people back into the labor market. But as you say, um, I think there are huge disparities still out there. Young workers still have much higher unemployment rates than other workers. Uh, black workers still have about two times the unemployment rate of white workers. Uh, we see, have seen wage growth in areas like leisure and hospitality has been stronger last year, is now coming <clears throat> down some. Right. That is decelerating. So I think that there are <clears throat> different stories. Um, and those wages in some of those industries with most amount of churn, those are still quite low. Right. At least we're spending a lot of time on the x-axis looking at the duration of these events. There is a negative wage growth. The real wage is decidedly negative. But importantly, the duration of that negative, almost the hysteresis of that negative wage growth, is substantial. What's the tipping point where that negative wage growth really affects society in America? Well, I think it is hitting pe many people right now already. Um, they're noticing it when they go to the grocery store. They're noticing it, obviously, when they buy gas, though we are seeing those energy prices come down. And I think that will trickle, that will filter into lower prices overall because transportation costs are a major factor in many of the costs. So I think it will become more affordable. I am somewhat optimistic, um, as you all were talking about before. I think there there is the ability to see that kind of optimism. Even though nominal wage growth is starting to slow a bit, I think that that rate of growth is starting to slow. I think that we will see um, gains in the future in terms of living standards as inflation comes down. Elaine, Lisa, I want to go to the point we were discussing earlier about how much fiscal policymakers' hands are tied when it comes to supporting the market when the economy does uh, start to decline, right? There is this feeling that it will have to slow materially, possibly go into a recession, and that fiscal uh, policymakers cannot spend to the same degree that they have in the past for fear of only fueling some of this inflation, fueling what the Fed has to do, and creating an even bigger downturn. Do you think that that is the appropriate way to look at <laughs> this, that there cannot be fiscal spending in the same kind of way, period, full stop, for years to come? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think we need to make the kind of investments that are necessary to do things like pull down inflation, pull down energy prices in the long run. I think that's what we're seeing in the Inflation Reduction Act. I think that we're going to see that in the future. I think that those investments are absolutely important. I also think about the kind of investments we need to make to increase the supply of workers. So make sure that we have as many workers out there as possible, and that will also help with the economic growth in the future. So doing things like making investments in care work, those kinds of things will allow more women to enter the labor force. Um, in fact, if you, if you have more people, workers entering the labor force, then that will put less pressure on wages. 
And so I can see there being different parts of this, but I, I don't actually think we need to have a substantial slowdown as we're already seeing inflation begin to fall. Right. I guess that I'm, I'm just questioning uh, certain aspects, and it's both the U.S. and internationally. When you start to talk about spending to support, especially lower income individuals who are really struggling, how much there will still be an open market for raising cash for those things, right? The U.S. perhaps not as serious of a condition as the United Kingdom in this capacity, but the student loan relief, measures like this, do you think that that is a net benefit even at a time when it could on the peripheries add to inflationary pressure? I think all the evidence suggests that that is a very tiny impact on any kind of inflation. So I don't think that is a major factor in thinking about whether or not something is a good policy. I think we can look at other things about who is going to be affected by the policy, how well um, how well it's going to be targeted, how well it's going to impact people's ability to make ends meet, all of those other things. I think the impact, the research shows that the impact on inflation is, is pretty negligible. At least one final question. If I could, there is a gross assumption that businesses and corporations out of the great financial crisis took the high ground in power over labor. There's now an assumption, perhaps, that labor is gaining strength coming out of this pandemic. Do you buy it? I do, actually. I think that we're seeing it in activities in terms of increased interest in unionization. We saw that recently with a Gallup survey about you know, growing numbers of people interested in collective bargaining. You're seeing those activities across the country. I think that will have some staying power. I think that people see that may translate into a bit more leverage uh, moving forwards. Lee Gold, thank you, of the Economic <clears throat> Policy Institute on the labour market in America. Important week for the labour market in America. The ADP report out about 15 minutes ago. Call it 20 minutes ago now. Downside surprise, 132. The estimate was 300K. Tom, teeing us up for Friday. 300K is the estimate, down yeah. from 528 in the and, previous month. And the vector on that was higher. What was it, John? 285 and a couple days ago, 300. Ish. It really hasn't been climbing moved, some, sure. you know. But I, I, I have so much trouble, John, with the gloom of a 300 or 285 number versus the normal time of, say, 200,000 or 225. I, just... I get that, Tom, but it's a barn door <clears throat> data point, right? As soon as you start getting concerned about that, the horse is bolted. Yeah, and you'd go with that. You know, you know, Frank, data. And John, you know, stay with me. September one, when the leaves begin to change, unit labor costs, frankly, is just as powerful as Jobs Day. It's going to show us, you know, that wage dynamic, that inflation dynamic. The most important data point, Tom, looking out, is going to be the unemployment rate. It's at three point five percent. It's expected to stay there on Friday. I keep saying this because I think it is going to be one of the most important stories in the next 12 months. The Fed is telling us, Lisa, that unemployment is going to climb. I'm not quite sure we've fully got our hands around what that's going to look like when it happens. Loretta Master saying she is expecting the unemployment rate to uh, climb to 4%. The argument that others make is that there still is so much room for people to come back to the labor market. The participation rate could go up. The productivity rate could go up. That it could create the soft landing that Elise Gould was talking about. But what happens if it doesn't happen? And must many people say that it's much more likely that we don't get that kind of Goldilocks uh, scenario? You're almost bullish then, Lisa. Almost. I'm being. I'm trying to be actually fair. Like these are the arguments that people are making. Balanced. Balanced. Yeah. Not just you know. I, I'm with you. Skeptical. I'm not sure what Tom's up to. Uh, You've been yeah. balanced, Tom. Yeah. You know. I'm, <laughs> That's a loaded question. You know, I'm, I'm get, well, actually, I'm getting ready for the tots. I can't focus. John, I just did a survey for you to get you up to Vermont for the leaves of October. They're sold okay. out. He's Woodstock in. That's, that's not Vermont. Icy. That's just what sold out. Full. They're just sold <laughs> off <laughs> completely. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. everything's off. Thanks. All right. No place to stay, John. No, oh, right. They're sold out of the hotels. <clears throat> yes. Okay. No, no, it's not a hotel. It's one of America's it's most an famous inn. inns. John, you don't call it a hotel. seriously, okay. Woodstock, Vermont was redone by John Rockefeller decades and decades ago. He was the first one to put the power lines below the street. So you drive right. into this town and it looks like a Dickens novel. Okay, I'm just picturing mm. right now us going on an apple picking trip. Oh, Tom will be no. reading Robert Frost. Yes. John will Tom be, be trying looking to at Wikipedia. <laughs> looking at Wikipedia <laughs> to tell us everything about that particular plot of land in Vermont. Okay, and, and you'll you be and I will be actually picking apples. <laughs> you'll be evaluating which apples are the John, best the and why they're the best. Vermont, they're and what swigging swigging cider and reading Wikipedia <laughs> and telling us all about it. I'm not going. No? Just no. Hey, Just come on, a remote? There. We can no. go up to Stowe, Vermont, John, a I'm remote, you know? I'm not going.
Senator Leahy could show the up. The Yankees owner has bought a minority stake in my football club, Tom. AC Milan. That's just happened, apparently. Really? We were expecting that to happen, but that's, well, just that's news you can use. Okay, we'd actually like to win something, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> make that happen. <laughs> Future's up a third from New York. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. More revelations in the probe of those classified documents found at Donald Trump's Florida home. In a court filing, the Justice Department suggests there may have been attempts to obstruct the investigation by moving some of the papers. The filing included a photo of files labeled top secret, said to have been found in the former president's office. The government was responding to his lawsuit to appoint a special master to review the documents. Europe faces the risk of blackouts, rationing and a severe res recession if Russia slashes gas deliveries further. And the next reality check is at hand. Starting today, there'll be a halt in gas sent through the Nord Stream pipeline. It's a key source of energy for the EU. There's a concern that Moscow will find another excuse to clamp down on supplies. Meanwhile, oil is headed for its third monthly drop in a row. That's the longest losing streak in more than two years. West Texas Intermediate has lost more than 6% this month. Economists see slower global growth, which would further hurt demand for oil. And Bloomberg has learned that Credit Suisse's board is divided on the fate of its troubled investment bank just before some crucial meetings. One camp is pushing back against an aggressive downsizing. Others are in favor of more extensive cuts. After racking up billions of dollars in losses, Credit Suisse is taking aim at the investment bank, which has been at the heart of some of its biggest troubles. And the U.S. Army has grounded its entire fleet of about 400 CH-47 Chinook transport helicopters. That's after engine fires broke out on a few of them. The twin engine helicopter has been in service for six decades. It's built by Boeing and the engines are made by Honeywell. The Army says it has identified the cause of the fires and is implementing corrective measures. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think it's coming back. And obviously, a lot of this is just going to have to do with the macro environment. You know, if we see markets crash again, we're going to see crypto crash along with it. If we see a market recovery, we're going to see a crypto recovery along with it. But I think this is, you know, it's flushed out a lot of the things that needed to be flushed out from the crypto space anyway. It wasn't Bed, bed Bath & Beyond, but to go from $24 billion to $8 billion net, worth, net worth makes it difficult 2024. Sam Bankman Freed with David Rubenstein. This is an extremely important conversation for all wired up to crypto like me and uh, Lisa. Mr. Rubenstein joins us this morning. Look for that 9 p.m. tonight. Um, this guy's controversial, to say the least. What is his cred? What is the, the thing that he has that makes people in crypto listen to him? Well, he's very smart, and he's made a lot of money. Uh, when you make a lot of he money— lost a lot of money, too, David. But at the age of 30, he was worth $22 billion. He became the youngest person to sign the giving pledge, and he's committed to giving away all his money. He basically spends nothing on himself. He lives in the Bahamas— basically has no clothes of any consequence. He wears shorts and T-shirts and tennis shoes all the time. He lives in a dorm with eight friends or so. He only cares about certain public issues and public policy, but he's very unusual. How does he control or what does he believe the price of Bitcoin will do? How does it discover a bid at whatever level? Well, I didn't ask him that because he basically he operates FTX, which is an exchange, so it gives everybody the opportunity to buy or sell Bitcoin or other uh, cryptocurrencies. He doesn't know what the right price should be. He recently bailed out a lot of uh, yes. companies that had troubles. He might lose money on all that, but he feels it was good for the industry. So why is this industry important from a social benefit kind of way if he is, David, incredibly idealistic and looking for the betterment of a, a social order? Well, his view is that uh, people who have money should give away that money or do things for good social purposes, and that's what he's always believed in. He now has a fair amount of money, and he's giving away a good deal of money. He's also involved in politics, and he gives a lot of money to politicians. He thinks it's good to get good public servants in government, and so he's trying to back the ones he thinks are good. He has an unusual lifestyle in that he's really not uh, buying any of the accoutrements of wealth that you normally get when you have a you know, multi-billion dollar fortune. I have to 
pivot a little bit because David Rubenstein, I caught uh, an article that was written about you a couple of days ago about your potential bid for the Nationals, possibly the Orioles, should they come up uh, for uh, offer. Ooh, is this, is this a baseball. moment of passion or is this something that's actually an investment at a time when a lot of people are looking for alternative assets? Well, um, you know, I, I realized when I was young I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player. I thought I was a great star at six or seven, but when I got to eight or nine, I realized I probably wasn't going to make the major leagues. So I figured if I ever get to the major leagues, I'd probably have to do it as an investor or an owner. So I, have, I am from Baltimore. Uh, I have looked at uh, whether buying a baseball team makes some sense, but it's too early to say what's going to happen now. I, I, Lisa, that was a very dangerous question. Why is it know. dangerous? David, do you think Rubenstein's it was a dangerous question? Ever gonna, ever gonna come back again. Um, to the point of baseball and sports, the stereotype of big hitters is they can buy any sports team and it never goes down. It just always goes up. Why is that? It's hard to lose money on a sports team generally. When you own them, the NFL teams, they make money as hand over fist. Um, baseball, basketball, um, other mm -hmm. teams, they make money when you tend to sell the team. Um, and so people rarely lose money selling a team. Uh, in the end, if you, right. you, you can support the team without uh, <clears throat> current income from the team, you can do quite well just holding it for quite some time. But if you look at most people who've made money in baseball, it's by selling the team, right. not operating it daily. On the other hand, some teams are very profitable on cash flow basis. Where are you and Carlisle with the investments over the years on public investment in stadium? Now, you don't need to do that in Baltimore because Camden right. Yards is truly one of our jewels. But but should public funds be spent? I'm trying to think of the city right now where this is a raging debate. Should we buy new baseball stadiums? Well, uh, every every government official presumably is elected by people, mm -hmm. and uh, they make the decisions that hopefully uh, reflect what their population right. wants. So populations tend to want these things. People like yeah. uh, sports teams. Uh, you, you have such an enduring place in philanthropy. If Mr. Sam Bankman-Fried enjoys going from $22 billion down to $8 billion, and let's say Bitcoin cracks and goes down to whatever, 12000 whatever, does he change I don't think he changes a lot. He's Remember, he's not spending this on his personal kind of uh, yeah. um, needs. He's not buying big right. homes or planes or things like that. Yeah. And I think whether he's worth $8 billion, $22 billion, or $1 billion, I don't think he's going to change very much. He's very young. Yeah. He's only 30 years old. I'd like you to come back and talk to me for one hour about the National Archives, which is being dragged through the mud right now. I know this is a third rail for you. And if you find the time and the energy, I would love to do a half hour nonstop on what is Anytime. in your heart and soul. The National Archives is a great institution in, in Washington and has all of the records of uh, our federal government, and it's been around from the 1920s. Um, they, they don't have a current head because uh, uh, David Ferriero resigned, retired, but there will be somebody who is uh, likely to be confirmed soon, the first woman to be the chief archivist of the United States. You talked right around me there. What if the right-wing part of America goes after your national archives with your philanthropy on Magna Carta and the rest? Well, there are people in Congress who I think will prevent that from happening. The system others. will I, prevent it. Yeah. I hope so. Right. David, thank you so much. Thank David you. Rubenstein, we know tonight with FTX CEO Sam Bankman Fried, and as Lisa Bramwitz said to me in my ear, Orioles three games behind in the wild card race uh, as well. Thank you for that information. He's going to keep throwing me under the bus, right? Yes, thank you. Basically, just trying to make me look like I'm See just See if the know, badge Sean works Jay. tomorrow. Fugis at 17. <laughs> right, Dow Fugis at Lisa, what are you looking at in the tape here? Uh, I think that I'm watching to see whether we get a little bit uh, more of the gains, particularly with the NASDAQ. I find this the most interesting that people are going back and buying big tech on this belief oh, that the economy will slow, that rates will get lower, that inflation expectations are coming down and pile back into big tech. It just is a tenuous tape. It is nudgy, to use your word, because people yeah. don't have conviction ahead of the labor market report. And, hey, I, I learned today that it's August still. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be really, really interesting here. We go to Jobs Day, folks, but also there's a whisper here of the effect of disinflation that's really not in the published uh, literature right now. I think we're going to see that with a vengeance here into September uh, as well. On Balance of Power, today on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio, she has my book of the year, Angela Stent on Putin. I gave a book of the year in February over her magisterial volume, Stent on Gorbachev. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to another special U.S. Open update for Bloomberg TV and radio from Tennis Channel. I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. Rafa moves on and Raducanu goes out on day two at the U.S. Open. Rafael Nadal had to work hard to get past Rinky Hijikata and reach the second round. After losing the opening set 6-4 to the young Aussie, the Spaniard put his foot to the floor before securing the win. Nadal can extend his lead on the all-time list at the Slams if he claims his fifth crown in New York and his 23rd major title. Up next for him, Italy's Fabio Fognini. On the women's side, defending champion Emma Raducanu was sent packing by Alizé Cornet in the biggest upset of the tournament so far. 22 winners for the French woman in the victory, while 31 unforced heirs told the story for the Brit. Cornet will face Katerina Sinyakova in round two. And don't forget, Tennis Channel Live has all the news you need. It hits the air daily at 9 a.m. Eastern.